Grazie. Bene, grazie. Cominciamo. Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session of the International Study Day on Gian Giacomo Paul di Pezzoli. I'm going to speak in English, but if anyone wants to intervene in Italian or say something in Italian, that's very welcome too. You may wonder why an Australian art historian is invited to chair um, a session in this distinguished Milanese museum. As a postgraduate student, I got to know the Poli Pezzoli, but my interest in it deepened greatly at the Getty Research Institute, where I met Alessandra Mottola Molfino. And you're looking here at an image of myself and Alessandra, and on the left-hand side, just above the fountain, is Burton Fredrickson. And on the right-hand side, um, famous figure Carlo Pedretti, who was very much in evidence um, doing Leonardo studies things, and he used to use a Valentina typewriter in the Getty, which was always sort of extraordinarily charming. <laughs> Anyway, I was invited by Burton Fredrickson to the Getty, as was Alessandra Mottola Molfino, and we another before. And Burton Fredrickson was just beginning the provenance index. Um, and it was an extraordinary thing that he was doing. He had people all over Europe collecting inventories and then feeding them online. And it's become the most amazing resource that you could imagine, particularly during lockdown, it was particularly <laughs> useful. And um, he, he should be remembered as someone who introduced all these studies uh, in the 70s and early 80s, which is when this was taken. This is um, a, a special event that the Getty had to celebrate the research that we were doing together. And Alessandra Mottola Mofino, who was the director before Annalisa Zanni, was invited because she was just beginning a whole series of studies about Milanese collectors and this very rich field of Lombardy art. I was invited to write the uh, preface to Mundler's travel diary. And <laughs> I was invited because I think Alice Waterhouse had died, unfortunately, and uh, they thought I knew quite a lot about Morelli and Mundler, and so I was invited. So Alessandra and I became very friendly, and we went all over California together looking at collections, and I learned a great deal from her. I'm sorry she's not here today, but uh, she, she did initiate these studies in a rather wonderful way. Then uh, I met another extraordinary woman who is well known to you, Eloisa Zanni, the director of the Poldi, and uh, they both have done, created a rather remarkable museum. Of course, there was the original collection, and Alessandra began a scientific program with catalogues by Mara di Natale and all that sort of thing. Um, but then Annalisa Zani has done extraordinary things here. Um, she's been a wonder, not only a wonderful scholar, but she's also been a very considerable entrepreneur and very able to bring in donations, acquisitions, all that sort of thing. We're sitting in a room which she created last May, and it's an extraordinarily efficient, seemingly natural addition to this museum. Whenever I come here, I'm amazed at the beauty of the place and how it grows, uh, how there is always a new acquisition, a new this, a new that, and it's always a, a collection. Someone described it as eclectic, but it always seems to me to be very naturally evolving, one room from another, whether it's the decorative arts, whether it's painting, whatever it is. And she too has become a very good friend, and I find myself very fortunate in having two extraordinary uh, friends who are both museum directors. And I think it's worth remembering that Italy, since the Second World War, has bred wonderful women museum directors in a way that no other country in the world has. Um, I could go on about this, but I won't. <laughs> I think I just make the point here. Now, the other <coughs> exciting thing about the Poldi is that when you come to Milan, there are always great exhibitions here. And um, it's very hard to choose which ones to privilege. But this one was one I was involved in a little bit because it happened after uh, I met Alessandra, and it was Le Muse e il Principe. And it was an exhibition about the culture of um, Studioli and based on um, a painting that they have here that's on the, on the cover by Cosme Tour, one of the Muses. And it was also uh, related to the one in the National Gallery and elsewhere. So she reconstructed this cycle. 
And the minor part that I had in this was that um, she asked me to write on the iconography, and the iconography was horrible because it didn't follow any consistent rules. So I asked some classicists in Oxford, and they found out that the source was a very, very rare text by Tetzus, who was a late classical author who had lost his library, so he decided to invent a tradition of the muses. <laughs> And this is what the text that they followed, Leonardo d'Este followed for the Studiolo. I remember at the opening to the exhibition talking to Roberto Colasso, and Roberto said, well, this is one of the most intelligent exhibitions I've seen in Milan. And, you know, it, it, it was very, very interesting. And the space they have here is very small, and they do a lot with that small space. Of Annalise's exhibitions, well, I particularly like the Molteni one because I was very into Molteni. It was the first exhibition ever about a restorer and, she, and, and, and also a considerable painter. who was the director of the Brera and uh, from whom office uh, pictures were repainted, remade, analyzed, reattributed, and then exported often around the world. Um, and uh, so it was for me a fascinating exhibition and Fernando Matsoka was a person who who was primarily responsible for it. And then, I mean, another favorite would be um, Botticelli and the Lombard collections. And that exhibition was really quite extraordinary because all these pictures that sometimes had been denigrated, misunderstood, suddenly emerged. And that was Andrea Di Lorenzo. And this is the, one of the most recent ones, the uh, Leonardo exhibition with the Madonna Lita which is carefully not attributed in the catalogue because of <laughs> Russian pride. <laughs> I think the same thing happened in London. Um, and it was a very beautiful exhibition, very Lombard, all about uh, things here. Well, my final point is the changing nature of archives and collections, both public and private. I've spent an awful lot of my life working in archives, and they change. They change a great deal. Um, it, whether they're public, whether they're private, things get lost, things reappear, suddenly found, um, are reinterpreted, or, or the handwriting is recognized as being by different people. So I'm showing you just two things. Um, one is a very careful letter that Giovanni Morelli wrote to Lady Eastlake, whom he adored. <laughs> and you can see the handwriting is very careful. Sometimes he wrote appallingly. Um, and um, it's in German, and he obviously corresponded with the East Lakes in German. And from these five or six pages, you know that there was a correspondence he had, particularly with Lady Eastlake, whom he got to know quite well after her husband died, and he came to England for the first time, and she showed him around British private, private collections. So, you know, this is the sort of document that comes up, and you wonder where on earth uh, is the correspondence? Will it emerge? In, in some sort of attic in Bergamo or, you know, <laughs> in London, or was it destroyed for some reason? There's only one letter that remains from Morelli to Eastlake, which is in the dossier at the National Gallery on uh, the Lorenzo Lotto's della Torre portrait. And it's a very interesting letter because Eastlake has said to him, well, do you really want your name attached to this acquisition? And he says, yes, I wanted to be known that I promoted Lorenzo Lotto abroad. So, but, you know, this obviously would be very interesting um, correspondence to find. And then on the other side are two horrendous pages from um, Otto Munter's dialogue books in German describing the Frizzoni collections in Bergamo and Bellagio. Now, when we did the edition of the, uh, of the notebooks that, are, that is out in the Walpole Journal, this was quite clearly a report that Munter made for the trustees of the National Gallery but these are the notes that he took them from. They're in German, and they're fiendishly difficult to read. So if any of you have any friends like Thomas Gertjens or someone looking for research projects, this is a project, I think, for the Germans. And it's, it's very important to do, um, and, they're, and they're very, uh, very interesting uh, things. We know that Gustavo Frizzoni inherited all of Morelli's correspondence with museum directors, and it's, most of them have dis been disappeared. So that's rather a pity. But I think it's important to realize that this conference that we're having now is something that is on, on the move, as it were. Things will emerge because of it. People will come here and they say, oh, well, I've got these documents, or maybe they're of use, or something like that. And things happen and things change. Well, that's enough for me as an introduction. Um, do, you, do you want to put on the next PowerPoint?
Thank you. La prossima. Okay. Va bene. We have. <laughs> We're going to begin with a joint presentation this afternoon. See, yes, but just after I've introduced them, if you don't mind, Lavinia, then just wait. <laughs> okay. Alessandra Scuzzato has been mentioned in many uh, contributions today. She's going to do a joint presentation with Lorenzo Tunesi from, from the Catholic University of Milan. And it's going to be on foreign travelers in Milan and their interests from the landmarks of the Grand Tour to the art dealers. And in, the, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in their summary of what they're going to do, they talk about the Reichsman in Milan, Alfonso Reichsman, who was the father of Clementina Reichmann, who was the mother of Gustavo Frizzoni. So, <laughs> and I mean, there's something, you know, all these people are very much interrelated, so I'm longing to hear. <laughs> what? what? What's the uncle? Oh, well, there you are. But I'm longing to hear about the Reichmans, who have always been, I, I think, a very interesting um, family. Thank you. The title of this speech may sound a little generic, but the idea is to speak about international mobility in our city, in particular in the decades when Gian Giacomo Poli Pezzoli lived. Our interest is in the private collection and museums which was his work. We would like to provide the case of Poli Pezzoli with some contextual elements that help to catch his uniqueness and precocity. I will deal with a general overview that is a synthesis of the data I have gathered. Instead, an in-depth case study is untrusted to Lorenzo Tunisi. Studies on the 18th century tell us that Milan was included in the Grand Tour route, not as an obligatory stop, but rather a stopover to most ambitious destination of classical culture, such as Rome or Naples, followed by Florence and Venice. Milan was not a first rank place because of the scarcity of the ancient remains, and yet the evidence of the travelers of the ancient regime who came here, Gibbon, Goethe, Laland, is numerous. There are necessary landmarks, landmarks such as the Ambrosiana Library and Gallery and the Settara Museum eclectic places designed to satisfy an encyclopedic curiosity. From the second half to the 18th century, the main city guides, such as that of uh, Carlo Bianconi, underlined the role played in the public decoration of the great uh, noble residen residence, residences. Those of the Cusani, Litta, Clerici, Belgioioso, Tribulzio, Simonetta, attracted foreigners above, above all for the life that was led there. The luxury of the furnishing, um, the sumptuous banquets, the carriage rides, the trips to the theater became extraordinary showcases also for local manufacturers with, within a promotional system. People coming from Northern Europe loved the Eternal City because of its antiquarian and landscape heritage, which was not found in Milan. This caused an inferiority complex, often declared in many ways, more or less irino, irino, ir, ironically, scusate, even at a figurative level. Some images I came across in these searches made me smile. A bucolic Brianza view near Milan, shown as if it was the countryside around Rome. An imaginary view with monuments of Milan, showing a canon of the Mirabilia Urbis Mediolani in the style of Giovanni Paolo Pannini. Perhaps, lo uh, potrete vedere più tardi. The image that uh, Milan will offer to foreign travelers is marked in the first decade 
of the century by a synthesis between two groups, historical buildings, especially the ecclesiastical ones, on the new and the new secular monuments that arose during and close to the fervent Napoleonic city. They were inspired by the ancient, but within a new perspective of modernity and functionality. For example, the new city gates, the San Francisco barracks, the Arco del Sempione. This is also the selection fixed by one of the most popular guides, in particular by English travelers, Mariana Starks and Books. Francis, uh, as Francis Askell reconstructed uh, in his fundamental rediscovery in art in 1976, it is only with difficult and not without fluctuation that a radical change in test would take place during those first decades of the century, perhaps the most sensational subversion of artistic values labeled by historiography as the rediscovering of the primitives. It happened together with other more historical and political factors, such as the last round of the suppression of ecclesiastical bodies and the process of constitution of the great European museums. All of these factors affected the, mo the movement of travelers to our country as regards their social status, their number, and at least partially modifying their interest and objective. In the words of the great Anglo-Saxon scholar, what was implemented was, I quote, a single colossal speculative campaign concerning the trade of works of art, a crowd of adventurous agents, merchants, pilot artists, descended in Italy like a flock of vultures and collected his body, his booty, ex uh, extorting it from the local nobility, forced to pay exorbitant taxes imposed by the invading French army. Then, commenting with the addition of a sentence of King George III, reported in the Annals of Fine Arts of 1817, I have never sent a nobleman in Italy without him later turning into a picture dealer. <laughs> within this, uh, re within, within this uh, re uh, renewed system of um, aesthetic and historical artics value, Milan could in fact present itself without too many inferiority complexes. His heritage, in particular the private one, had been largely preserved by Napoleonic spoliation. This treasure had even improved thanks to the suppression of church and convents. This was foreseen by a whole series of promoters of test, as Alessandro Morandotti shrewdly defined them. Intermediate figures between the world of Arctic erudition and that of commerce went to make up for the shortcomings of official historiography, also knowing the international situation thanks to the branch of their companies located in Paris and London that have already been established for a long time in the channel of the book trade. Restarting the movement of foreigners at the end of the second decade, the demand for guides increased on the one hand to root to the knowledge of the heritage, on the other albums of view, almanacs, gifts, and printed repertoires to be brought back home as souvenirs. The nouvelle description de la Ville de Milan belongs to uh, this first kind of publication. It was compiled in 1819 by Giovanni Battista Carta, with the support of a swarm of very prolific publishers, such as Giovanni Pietro Jegler, Ferdinando Artaria, and the Bettali brothers. The publication was in evident competition with that drawn up in the same year by Luigi Bossi, Guide des étrangers in Milan, for uh, the rivals Pietro and Giuseppe Vallardi. The opening statement reads, Milan is the meeting place for artists of all kind and in everything related to the arts. Now we can call the Milanese the Italian par excellence. And this declaration is followed by, 
by a very detailed praise of local manufacturers in their very wide repertoire, making it clear that the reference is made to an, an experience of artistic production still in progress, not just in the past one. Private places uh, on the same level of importance as the church and public monument are listed in uh, great abundance. In the slide, uh, I have uh, a sample picture with description of the architecture and the interior decoration, but also in many cases with hints to their respective galleries and collection. Not only do the large properties of ancient aristocratic formation appear, but also from a very up-to-date perspective, the very recent ones. The works of art are gradually disclosed, selecting, uh, selecting some of them from time to time according to a logic that is uh, not always clear. Of preference, promotion, easy access. Particularly privileged are the names of the great masters of the Italian 16th century, Tiziano Correggio Raffaello, who remain of strong appeal, especially for foreigners, alongside the masters of the local school, such as Bernardino Luini, Cesare da Sesto, Gadenzo Ferrari, to reach a wider audience. Palazzo Pezzoli is named for the quality of Cantoni's architecture and the 18th century frescoes of Castello and Montalto. No artistic collection is mentioned. While in the category of the Bibliothèque Particulière, there is a collection of a fine edition with reference to the precious Aldine that constitute one, constitute one of the legacy of Gian Giacomo from his uncle Abbot Gian Maria. It is a fact that all these colossal collecting operations was bid from scratch and that in order to emerge within such a rich and varied horizon, he had to someone create something very new and never seen before. It is clear that within his huge Regno Quadrario, as it was acutely defined by Federico Cavalieri, it was not easy to find your way. First of all, there was the problem of uh, li limited access bound to the owner's permission. In fact, let letters of recommendation written by friends uh, or acquaintances already introduced uh, into the environment uh, were needed. For example, Vallardi, in his itinerary, devoted an entire par paragraph among the pre precautions to be taken for the trip to Italy to this need. It is not easy to monitor this process if uh, not from sources within the families. For example, some traces of it are left behind by the ex exceptional Borromeo archive on Isola Bella within a fund specifically named Visite. Uh, there is, for example, the correspondence between Prince Borromeo and the assistance of the house appointed to verify the credential of visitors and to illustrate uh, the collection. On the visitor side, we learn the importance of the entratura, as we say in Italy, from Lady Sidney Morgan's correspondence in Milan in 1819, only thanks to the confalonieri cons belonging to the liberal party like her husband, did she manage to enter the casino dei nobili and visit the famous uh, collection of Etruscan, Etruscan vases of Conte Porro. The intermediary becomes a reference figure if he, has an art ex, if he is an, ex, an art expert, also to uh, extricate the attribution of uh, varied heritage that uh, has had a centuries old stratification, having never been uh, exhibited um, in a public uh, institution, therefore poorly um, monitored by the study. Alessandro Morandotti told us well the distance that uh, emerges at this level in the middle of the century between local experts and foreign uh, connoisseurs, and which is also clearly visible if uh, um, one compares the guides uh, made in Italy and the Anglo-Saxon ones. I was very impressed by the 
examining scientific and connoisseur level of the handbook of travelers in North Italy published by Murray, where there are many references to the works of Franz Theodor Pugle. In conclusion, I will only briefly mention another important uh, theme for travelers, that uh, of the so-called so surroundings, uh, pointing out the Manuel Pittoresque des Etrangers, published by Casa Artaria in 1832. It was an intermediate character, it has an intermediate character between the Strenna and the Guide and Gritil uh, in essence uh, the roots suburban areas, in particular to the late of Como, Varese and Lugano. These itineraries responded well to the practice of English education on the study of the landscape and also to the theme of uh, the romantic sublime. In the hands of the Milanese publisher, the environ uh, became an opportunity to celebrate some local glories, such as the uh, Giuditta Pasta, uh, and um, again act as a um, sounding board for collecting, as shown, for example, by the view of the famosa Villa Sumariva. Even Gian Giacomo had to suffer the charm of these places by having a beautiful villa, formerly Taverna, rearranged by his trusted architect Pazzaretto. I stop and leave the floor to Lorenzo Tunisi, who deals with the spe spe specific case of one of these intermediaries, intermediaries Alfonso Reichmann, who will also uh, allow us to take a look at the German world. Okay, I think, I'm not sure about it, but I think we can try and go. And today, at least, I think this is the opportunity for us to try to use some of these resources. Okay. I would like to use some of the tools that uh, Alessandra talked about some minutes later, uh, some minutes before, and on a specific episode, that of Alfonso Wright, and finding, if possible, some interesting relationships around this figure. Reichmann is not entirely unknown to studies uh, relating to the Milanese art market and collecting, but in fact, this is not yet a case study that has been gutted and clarified by research. He became a fairly well-known merchant in the middle of the century, starting his training in the artistic field from his hotel that you can see in Palazzo Acerbi in Corso di Porta Romana in Milan. And by virtue of his contacts with foreign visitors, attracted by, as you know, many precious goods to buy. It should not surprise us to the test of the facts. The whole Milanese scene lived, and even in its most daily and minute expressions from the related activities of the art market. It's a very artisanal work today. I would mention here in a minute the emblem case in that sense of Pietro Verselli, simple cafe holder of a business in Corso di Porta Vercellina, a few steps away and in front of Palazzo Litta, that you can see on the left. We would have seen the windows of this restaurant or cafe here on the right uh, in, the low, in the low image, a few meters away from the sign of Spezzeria Pessina. We would have found right there his cafe. Roverselli was, um, was just a cafe holder, and uh, the place where uh, his shop was was a great crossroad of tourists who passed from Porta Vercellina to uh, Santa Maria delle Grazie to San Maurizio after having educated himself on the artistic uh, subject. Roverselli transforms into a middleman, uh, a smart intermediary from whose hands are past paintings capable of uh, even tripling uh, their values. For example, the Mantegna from Casa Mellerio and then Somalia, retrieved by the real dealer Giuseppe Baslini and later sold to the highest authority of the National Gallery, Sir Eastlake. In short, Roverselli 
whom uh, later the expert Maurice Moore will consider a cheeky liar, and his commissions a gratuitous waste. In the 50s, uh, build up his own profession with uh, great profit, acquiring, and not by chance, some pieces that uh, have escaped from Palazzo Litta after the auction of 8037. And then escorting Mundler to other collections, collection uh, Pedemonte, for example, until he built his own collection in 1858. Not bad for a barista. Just like Robert Selly, Reichmann was born in an informal system, devoid of uh, specific training and less than an amateur one. Instead, he was a hotelier, inheriting this profession from his father, whose name was Federico Reichmann, who, with his family, had already settled in Milan at the end of the 18th century. He had opened a small boarding house, in Italian we'll say Pensione, Pensione Reichmann, and relying on uh, his contacts with Germany and the German-speaking Switzerland, he began to establish his own international clientele in Contrada di Moroni. And with the zoom, you can, we can see the old Pensione Reichmann in this partial aqua, twin, aqua tint with a panorama of the city. We will see some then-renowned hotels that are offered like um, just a simple shadow of a, of a parcel, for example, Albergo di San Marco, Albergo d'Europa, Albergo Reale. It was one of the most important hotels in Milan at the time. But the Reichmann pension, the Reichmann, uh, Pensione Reichmann, is the only one that has the great honor of an uh, entire uh, 3D rendering, we'll say. And maybe we know the reason, but because the author of this, um, of this engraving was the Swiss sculptor Heinrich Keller. As you can uh, read right there. That stayed, actually stayed at Reichmann's house, having some kind of bond with Alfonso's father. Uh, Keller was, in fact, also a sincere friend of Enrico Milius, the famous entrepreneur and collector whose nephews, Giorgio and Federico Milius, were later known by Alfonso Reichmann. So, I think the solidarity between the Protestant immigrants in Milan was among one of the first triggers that, uh, of the success of the Reichmann family. I can imagine something like that. And when the print was published in 1817, Alfonso Reichmann was only five years old. Uh, it was the year in which uh, Enrico Milius was the guide in Milan for the Grand Duke of Weimar, Carlo Augusto. And a few years later, this panorama was republished by the same Vallardi of the itinerary of Italy who, that uh, Alessandra mentioned before. The family business apparently grew rather quickly. From 1821, the Reichmanns became owners of the adjacent Palazzo Acerbi which since the beginning of the century had instead been owned by the Napoleonic general Domenico Pino. You can see in the engraving that uh, he has uh, the name Casa Pino. So Palazzo Cerbi was before Casa Pino. Some pieces of the Calderara Pino collection that have been studied must have found space right there, even if the main building of the family was the one near San Giorgio Palazzo. So Palazzo Cerbi, the 17th century building, offered a notable advancement in the accommodation offer from a pure family management of the Reichmann, the Pensione Reichmann, to a complex machine finally enlarged to larger spaces and richer spaces. The proposal that we, uh, we can find in uh, Reichmann's hotel um, was very rich, as you can imagine, only taking a look at this flyer in four languages for all the people coming in Milan from all the countries. Um, and at the end of the 20s, the structure hosted clients such as Augustus von Goethe, for example, the son of the great Goethe, the poet Heinrich Heine, and the art historian Karl Friedrich von Rumor, who found a stop there during the last uh, one of his free travels in Italy. In 1843, Alfonso, <coughs> Alfonso Reichmann and his brother Guglielmo were officially the owners of the hotel. So now Alfonso Reichmann is the, is the owner of <coughs> the Reichmann uh, 
the, of the Albergo Reichmann, and other interesting guests continue to flock to the structure, such as Otto Mundler, that we know very well, and most likely Sir Rieslick himself. In the mid-50s, Alfonso Reichmann was treated cordially as a known person by the German who always gladly let himself be carried around for collection, as we know. Reichmann clearly acts as an in intermediary between uh, sellers and, um, and people like Mundler and Eastlick. Uh, for example, Mundler announces that one day Reichmann, I'm citing, Reichmann brings me to the whole dealer Castagna, whose name I had forgotten and where I had been twice before, nothing worth seeing. Now, leaving aside the context of the hotel itself, where we understood that there were profitable relationships, uh, the, the dynamic had to be very casual. Uh, Mundo speaks, for example, of a great ball dance at Reichmann's, who introduces me to his friend Zotti, who has a collection of pictures to dispose of. Here we are citing the collection of the entrepreneur Cesare Bozzotti then at this point was perhaps arranged in the rooms of his house in Santa Maria Fulcorina. And we, Francesca Tasso had uh, uh, showed us some slides um, where uh, Cesare Bozzotti was one of the people in the commissions for the uh, Industrial Art Museum and for the exposition uh, of the uh, 1874. So not only the local and foreign nobility, not just travelers, but even an entrepreneur like Bozzotti could attend uh, some frivolous event like a dance in a, in a whole palace. It occurs to me right now that, for example, <clears throat> Giulio Milius, the what, that was the son of Enrico Milius, we have just mentioned him before, took part in the famous Battiani Ball in 1828, dressed, as you know, in rich costumes invented by Francesco Ayez, directed with, uh, by let's say directed by Alessandro Sanquirico, Giovanni Migliara, and Rodolfo Vantini. I want to, um, to mention those names because Vantini was um, an acquaintance of Federico Reichmann, the father of Alfonso, and in the year 1838, the year after his death, after the, uh, the death of Federico, he prepared the design for the funeral monuments of uh, Federico. So, they had a strong bond, a strong relation. Another friend of Antini and a close friend of Reichmann was Federico Frizzoni, the brother of uh, Giovanni Leonardo Frizzoni, that later married Clementina Reichmann. So Clementina Reichmann was the sister of Alfonso Reichmann, uh, and uh, that means that Reichmann was the uncle of Gustavo Frizzoni. That is now a relation, a family bond that uh, had never been highlighted, I think, right now, until now. Um, we have to say that for now there are no documents that explain something about the relations between the uncle, Reichmann, and the nephew, uh, Frizzoni. Indeed, um, Giovanni Morelli's esti words about Reichmann on the occasion of the purchase of this painting, a portrait of a woman in a red dress attributed to Hans Milik suggest, uh, suggest that there were at least no special confidences between the two. Uh, this sale to Morelli is one of the traces of the merchant Reichmann. We can recognize him active as an art advisor and merchant at least since the second half of the 50s. Uh, when he requested an export permit for a work attributed, uh, attributed to Bernardino Luini, today still to be found, it was a very spoiled fresco on canvas depicting uh, Madonna and Child with saints. And the buyer was uh, George II, the future Duke of Saxe Meiningen, a prestigious client that maybe you know. Uh, Reichmann was able to meet him during one of his trips uh, to Milan. The painting was until then kept in Palazzo Cervi, in the hotel. Clearly visible to every guest as another series of works that had to suitably furnish the common and private areas, private spaces, transforming the entire building into a shop enriched by an elegant and rarefied setting, uh, very different from the, the classic merchant atelier. Just to be clear, you can see in this view 
some carpets hanging from the balconies and a giant statue right there at the stairs entrance. This is to think that they were the first sign of a, of a continuous staging. It won't, it won't be possible for me today to retrace each of the proofs of Reichmann's merchant activity, which are remarkable, and reveal a surprising amount of relationships around them, not only between private buyers and sellers, but even with museums. The official seat of his business as a merchant remains presso l'albergo Reichmann. He worked at the Reichmann's hotel. The merchant worked at his hotel, as indicated in several documents. Sometimes it doesn't have to look uh, far from here. Recovery, for example, some pieces from the Annoni collection, that was the palace in front of Palazzo Cerbi. And then some of these pieces were sold, uh, resold to Frederick Stibbert. It was Stibbert himself who used Reichmann willingly and for many years, uh, obtaining from him other pieces from uh, Casa Trivulzi or from the collection of Guido Visconti di Modrone, up to these circles. Destined, destined for the Neo-Egyptian temple designed by the architect Giuseppe Poggi. Reichmann then managed the collection of William Curie, his son Carlo, offering pieces for purchase to the consulta of the Milan Archaeological Museum. It is one of the first approaches to the museum, uh, towards which Reichmann has an attitude, as it may seem even impartial, but we are not sure about it, um, without looking for benefits, let's say. He maintains uh, correspondence with the Municipal Art Museum of Milan, as well with uh, the Commission for the Historical Exhibition of Industrial Art. He donated some works and helping officials to establish contacts with foreign museums. In particular, and I think this, this is important, in particular with the Germanisches National Museum in Nuremberg, the president of the Commission for the Milan Exhibition, Fuzier, praised the brilliant relations activated by the delegate of the Germanic National Museum of Nuremberg, Alfonso Reichmann. So it was clearly considered a delegate of a foreign museum, but we will have to find uh, new evidences about that precise link. It seems possible to find him everywhere, from Florence to Stuttgart, passing through the Institute of Fine Arts of the region Marche, where they talked about him, uh, mentioning him, him as a distinguished patron, or in San Marino, where he collaborates with uh, Cibrario, Gaetano Speluzzi, and Charles de Brook, donating many art objects and founding the State Museum of the Republic. He even pushes one of his clients, Curry, to donate a beautiful St. John the Baptist to San Marino, to today recognized uh, Bernardo Strozzi. As I told before, we will need a long research to clarify his role in so many different contexts, but now we know that these generous activities were carried out in the same years in which he continued his profession as a merchant. And I just want to finish uh, <clears throat> with this image because in those months in his hotel was the splendid adoration of the child by Bernardino Campi acquired from the Somi Picenardi collection in Reichmann's hotel in 1868, the painting was visited on site by two connoisseurs, perhaps the couple Cavalcaselle Crow. Just a minute to say that Reichmann had, uh, had a role in the, um, in the 1874 exposition of industrial art, where he collaborated with Gian Giacomo Paul di Pezzoli and Giovanni Battista Lucini Passalacqua in, um, in creating uh, those uh, panoplies, trophies of arms to decorate the walls of the Salone dei Giardini di Porta Venezia. As we listened before in the speech of Francesca Tasso, that was another event of great interest and even for foreigners uh, who looked to Milan in those years. Thank you. Um, okay, I got it. In his book, uh, History and Its Images, published in 1993, Francis Haskell pointed out how in, how in the early 18th century, the Napolitan philosopher Gian Battista Vico shed new light on the fact that the study of ancient art 
constitute a privileged tool for understanding the origins of civilizations. However, vehicle that primarily with literature and poetry, and therefore his impact on art historiography was only indirect. More recent studies, however, have shown how Vico's thought influenced scholars and artists particularly interested in the theme of the origins of art and architecture, including, for example, the antiquarian Scipione Maffei, the theorist and collector of Italian primitives, Carlo Lodoli, the artist Tiepolo and Piranesi, and the scholar and collector Richard Payne Knight. This paper aims to add to this short list of, of uh, two 19th century museographic projects. The collection formed by Michele Cavaleri in Milan between 1848 and 1872, and the Museum of Enrico Cernuschi, founded in Paris in 1873. Both collectors drew inspiration from the reinterpretation of Vico's thought carried out by the philosopher Gian Domenico Romagnosi, Carlo Cattaneo, and Giuseppe Ferrari in the first uh, half of the 19th century in Milan, a point to which I will return often during my lecture. A detailed, a detailed analysis of Vico philosophy of history which can be very complex and at times inconsistent, goes beyond the scope of this lecture. However, in relation to what I will be discussing, a few concepts can be briefly outlined. First point, Vico focused on his historical approach on the study of all society and civilization rather than uh, on individuals. Therefore, he believed that a philological study of collective forms of human expression, such as languages, laws, institutions, myths, legends, religions, and of course, the arts, was the best approach to understand the origins, progression, and downfall of society, and the evolution of human knowledge. The second point is that Vico's new science of humanity, as expressed in his most famous book, published in 1725, I Principi di una scienza nuova di intorno alla comune natura delle nazioni, principle of a new science uh, concerning the common nature of nations, adopted a pioneering comparative approach, drawing parallels between archaic or primitive cultures, such as Homeric Greeks, ancient Germans, prehistoric Picts, and Native Americans, in order to understand their shared social and cultural characteristics. Final important point, unlike other 18th century scholars, such as Winkelmann, Vico therefore did not believe that it was a single canonical aesthetic and cultural idea based on classical Greece and Rome, but instead multiple canons that could only be understood within the historical and cultural context. This led to his famous revaluation of the Homeric oral tradition, as well as of pre-Roman Italy or the Middle Ages. If Vico Stoft did not enjoy much success during the 18th century, he became widely disseminated in re Restoration Europe when La Scienza Nuova was translated into many languages. Vico historicism, as well as his philological method, resonated with di the different European national historiographies of the time. In France, for example, Vico's ideas were used by Jules Michelet to place the French Revolution in a wider cycle of change, while German scholars adopted his philological approach to the study of German ancient languages and civilization. In Italy, Vico's philosophy of history was instrumental in the definition of a unitary national identity. Because in, um, Gian Domenico Romagnosi played a central role in the re-evaluation of Vico during the Restoration period, a role recently reaffirmed in the publication Vico e la filosofia civile in Lombardia, edited by Jerry Cerchiai. As I will discuss in detail, his philosophical program was formative for a whole generation of Milanese scholars, among whom number uh, both Michele Cavaleri and Enrico Cernuschi. Romagnosi recognized Vico historicism as the starting point of his civic philosophy, which, through the study of the past institution and its societies, saw concrete solutions for political reforms in the age of revolutions. Romagnosi encouraged students to study Vico, culminating in the critical edition of the philosopher's writings edited by Giuseppe Ferrari in 1830s. 
Romagnosi and his students aim at updating and broadening some aspect of Vico historicism, an approach particularly relevant to the topics discussed here. The, import the importance assigned to the new science of archaeology in the study of history and society induced Romagnosi to apply Vico analysis of primitive myths and legends in literature to the visual arts too. For example, in 1827, Romagnosi published The Symbolic Science of the Ancients, where he outlined a pioneering distinction between iconography and iconology a century before Panofsky. His most brilliant pupil, Carlo Cattaneo, published an essay in 1837 titled De Bello nelle Arti, On Beauty in the Arts, where he argued that historical ornaments were the first visual vocabulary used by humans as a means of organizing space in different civilizations. Romagnosi also drew inspiration from the studies in comparative linguistics and geography um, that had been given great impetus in the, 19, in the early 19th century by the European discovery of Sanskrit and the Indo-European languages, especially in Germany. This discovery, together with the birth of modern archaeology, had pointed to an ancient history of migration, exchanges, domination, and subjugation, much older and more dynamic than that of Vico. These discoveries also confirm how repeated contacts with Asian peoples and culture had played an important role in the formation of European civilization, an aspect that Vico's comparatives had neglected in favor of a narrower Judeo-Christian perspective. Romagnosi and his pupil does embark on a wide-ranging activity of translation, dissemination, and study of Eastern civilization, particularly Indian, Chinese, and Japanese, in order to expand the comparative approach to the study of civilizations. In the early 1860, Catano wrote on Il Politecnico three seminal essays on ancient and modern China, Japan, and India, while in 1868, Giuseppe Ferrari published uh, the book L'Europe et la Chine, in which he attempted to demonstrate the historical similarities between the two civilizations. Let's now explore how Romagnosi's approach to Vico and the comparative study of world civilization informed two particular museum projects, starting with Cavaleri, about whom little is known. A lawyer in Milan, in 1861, he was elected to the first Italian parliament as a left winger who was close to the liberal, republican, and federalist idea of his friend and mentor, Giuseppe Ferrari. Cavalieri's great passion, however, was his museum, which was built in the same years when Gian Giacomo Paul di Pezzoli was forming his own collection in the central decades of the 19th century. Cavalieri intended this collection for public use from the outset and over the years worked hard to find suitable place to exhibit his works of art. The collection moved several times and in 1871 Cavalieri finally found a satis satisfactory home on the outskirts of Milan, Casa Fortis, where the museum was opened in April of that year. It contained more than 60,000 works of art, mostly sourced from the dispersion of ecclesiastical properties. Thanks to the letters between Cavalieri and Ferrari preserved in the Civiche Raccolte Storiche di Milano and the few articles published on the occasion of the opening of the museum to the public in 1871, it is possible to reconstruct the ideas and models that inspired his museographic project. In his inaugural speech, Cavalieri described the origins of his museum, explicitly emphasizing the importance of Vician ideology, as he called it through the lesson of Romagnosi. He then continued by stating that, quote, art is primarily a social manifestation, and artists, without being entirely aware of it, draw their artistic inspiration and their symbols from society. I wanted to present here the symbol of the history of the human family and its development, end of quote. The same concept was echoed by Ferrari in an article dedicated to the opening of the museum. Quote, in every age, thought is expressed through the symbols of art. Objects bring us traces of life, end of quote, which is also the title of my paper. The rich library formed by Cavalieri physically occupied the central part of the museum and formed its very backbone. 
At the heart of the library was an important collection of medieval communal charters and interpretation of the Code of Justinian, together with a collection of around 420 early editions of Dante's work. One of the main uh, reasons why Vico appealed to historians of the Italian Risorgimento was that he had shown how the birth of modern national monarchies was rooted in the Italian municipalities of the Middle Ages. Vico had succeeded in demonstrating this genesis precisely through a philological study of the Italian medieval charters and their recovery of the code of Just Justinian. Vico's assessment of the Middle Ages, however, wasn't merely historiographic, but also cultural, as he was the first to reevaluate Dante's work on the assumption that every poetic work had to be understood in relation to the culture that had produced it. That was, in Vico's eyes, a historian of his own time. It is in this light that Cavalleri's collection of early editions of Dante should be understood not as an idealistic celebration of the poet, but rather as a tool to promote the study of the first historian of the Middle Ages. To encourage comparison between civilization, the museum antechamber displayed archaeological artifacts from the four corners of the world, Greek, Egyptian, Etruscan, Peruvian, and Far Eastern, organized according to the key categories used by Vico to analyze primitive societies, namely marriage, family, religion, and burials. The topic of burials was particularly dear to Cavalleri, whose museum also housed the mummy. In an article published in the Emporio Pittoresco, after a brief survey of the various funerary costumes found in different civilizations, Cavalleri argued that art and architecture had, had originated in the early society around burial rituals. Etruscan archaeology, which in the early 19th century had been reinvigorated by a series of particularly important excavations, including those promoted by Prince Canino and studied by Romagnosi, occupied an important position within the museum. A comparison of Etruscan and Egyptian artifacts promoted with the help of copies echoed Vico's theories of a possible eastern origin of the Etruscan, a hypothesis that had triggered a lively historiographical, historiographical debate in pre- and post-unification Italy. As an introduction to the medieval section of the museum, two texts were displayed on bookstands. The Monumental History of Art by Seruda Jancourt, translated in Italian in 1826, and a collection of facsimiles of scarce and curious prints by the early master of Italian, German, and Flemish school by William Otley. The medieval section opened with a collection of illuminated manuscripts, including the famous Benedictine choir books from the Church of San Sisto in Piacenza, one of the museum highlights. In particular, miniatures, much more ab abundant than medieval paintings on panel and fresco, were considered, as Ferrari himself underlined in his article dedicated to the museum, the missing link between classical and renais Renaissance art. Um, to complement the arrangement of medieval manuscripts, several 14th and 15th century, oh sorry, it's not this. Several, uh, to complement the arrangement of medieval manuscripts, se several 14th and 15th century panels, a few Flemish um, <laughs> primitives were hung on the walls. While a case displayed 2,000 lead statues representing kings and knights in Abur and covered with mysterious writings that Cavalleri thought to date back to 11th century, while they were 19th century forgeries. Obsessed with these statuettes and to determine their origins, he had consulted the great expert of the time on Norman and medieval archaeology, from Edmund de Sommerard and Adrien de Lomperier in Paris to the Italians Michele Amari and Gregorio Gdolena. The section dedicated to Renaissance art displayed an impressive collection of paintings from the Lombard School. 
The zenith of the collection was represented by the cycle of frescoes with story of Cephalus and Procris by Bernardino Luini, which were shown together with a fresco from the demolished cloister of Santa Maria della Passione in Sant'Ambrogio in Milan that Cavalieri had helped to rescue and preserve. Arranged uh, around the fresco, there was a collection of more than 400 altarpieces and paintings attributed to Mantegna, Luini, Gaudenzio Ferrari, Foppa, Zelale, just to name a few. The display was completed by wooden nativity scenes, cassoni and sculpture in marble, bronze and terracotta. Cavalieri Lerang or Romagnosi indication adopted in his writing an iconological interpretation of re the religious symbolism of his artworks, relating it to specific forms of thought and cultural settings, while being completely insensitive to the stylistic and formal analysis of the old artworks, which was the more common approach of the time. A privileged place in Cavalieri Museum was occupied by Asian artifacts, especially bronze and graphic arts, that he had collected during the years, but with mixed results, as he had very limited knowledge in this field. In his inaugural speech, he reminded, quote, the necessity of studying China and the many, many Asian populations, studies that were not undertaken by Vico, who had left incomplete his work on the origins of early civilization, end quote. These studies were instead undertaken, as I have already mentioned, by Romagnosi and his pupil, whose books were on public display in the Cavalieri Museum, along with many others, to stimulate an historical comparative study between Eastern and Western arts, from the Italian translation of William Robertson's Disquisition on India, translated by Romagnosi, to Humboldt's publication and Julius von Moll's Coll Collection Orientale. The overall story of the physical formation of Cavalieri's museum, as well as its relatively poor reception and final dispersion, will be the subject of a different lecture and part of my forthcoming book on Enrico Cernuschi. Suffice to say here that mainly because of the hostility expressed by the moderate right political faction towards Cavalieri, a far-left Republican, the City Council of Milan refused to buy his collection when he offered it for sale in 1872. Already in May 1873, the collection had led for Paris, crammed into numerous trains wagons to be bought for 300,000 uh, lire by Enrico Cernuschi. It was precisely the focus on Oriental arts and the desire to develop their study that inspired the transfer of the Cavalieri Museum to Enrico Cernuschi. The idea of the sale ca came from Giuseppe Ferrari, who, as we know, had dedicated one of his books to the comparative study of China and Europe. Cernuschi had been Ferrari's political companion during the Milanese insurrection in 1848, and the two had met again later in Paris in the Salon of the Italian Exiles. In the following years, Cernuschi had become very rich thanks to his activity as a financial broker. At the moment of the acquisition of the Cavalieri collection in 1873, he had just returned from a long trip to the Far East, bringing back an exceptional collection of ancient Chinese and Japanese bronzes. Cernuschi, like Cavalieri, had studied Vico's philosophy of history in Milan under his mentor, Carlo Cattaneo, the famous philosopher, activist and pupil of Romagnosi, whose study of ancient Chinese and Japanese civilization had had a crucial impact on the formation of Cernuschi taste. Ferrari could uh, therefore be certain that Cernuschi would fully understand the ethos of Cavalieri's museum, my extensive research into the archive materials has my extensive research into archives material has confirmed that Chernusky's initial museographic project was fundamentally anthropological and comparative in its approach, an aspect that has not been taken into consideration so far in analysis of the Chernusky Museum and, uh, and of its intellectual background. For Chernusky too, artistic expression were related to forms of thought and to cultural frameworks. The, this perspective was clearly rooted in Cernuschi Milanese philosophical education and structured around the three main themes of comparativism, archaeology, and anthropology. 
The traditional interpretation of the Chernusky Museum as a collection dedicated solely to Asian art, similar to Emile Guimet Museum, is mainly based on the fact that the museum initial arrangement, which, which also included the Cavalieri collection, was drastically changed shortly after Chernusky's death in 1896, when the Asian art collection was donated to the Ville de Paris, while the Cavalieri collection was dispersed at public auction. Chernusky Hotel Particulier on the Parc Monceau was built with the express purpose of housing his and Cavalieri's collection. From a summary of the building maintenance cost, date 1874, we learn, for instance, that the Cavalieri collection was displayed on the ground floor of the building, distributed in rooms with evocative names such as Musée Cluny, Wooden Crash Room, and Gaudenzio Ferrari Cloister, where presumably Ferrari's birth of the Virgin, now in Brera, was shown. Luini's frescoes were hung in the hall together with some Etruscan vases and statuettes, while the Asian art collection was arranged on the Piano Nobile. A comparative layout similar to that adopted in the Cavalieri Museum becomes clear when looking at the architectural setting of the museum. The interiors in which the works of art were exhibited were decorated with a large array of symbols. The ground floor, for example, featured Greek key patterns, while Indian swastikas were originally printed on the wallpaper of the first floor. The Chinese and Japanese bronzes were also arranged to suggest a comparative rather than an art historical analysis, not the least because knowledge of Chinese and Japanese art was still very scarce at the time. They were displayed around the monumental Japanese statues of the Buddha Amida, divided by typology and geographical origins to stimulate comparison between objects of similar nature. Chernusky Milanese background also shaped his interest in archaeology and in the origins of civilizations. In Paris, he connected with cultural circles that had similar intellectual approach and agendas to those supported in Milan by Romagnosi. For instance, he frequented the circle of Madame Hortense Cournou, Napoleon III Foster's sister, who had brought to Paris a large portion of the Campana collection, mostly composed of archaeological specimens. Cournou was the only woman allowed to attend meetings of the Académie des Inscriptions and had sponsored numerous archaeological excavations in the Middle East, including those of historian Ernest Renan in Syria. In the 1860s, Chernusky himself practiced some amateur archaeological excavation in Egypt and Tunisia, discovering, for instance, a rare, a rare inscription dedicated to the Punic goddess Rabatanit. Chernusky's archaeological and anthropological approach to artworks is revealed also in a letter written to the art historian Eugène Munz, where he argued that the motive underlying his collection of Asian art and artifacts was to show the production techniques behind archaic Asian bronzes. The invention of the bronze technique in Asia dated back to the second millennium before Christ in Korea and China. And Chernusky pieces, some of them over 4,000 years old, were considered of the utmost importance also because they were, not compar they were not comparable ensembles in Europe at the time. A selection of Chernusky's most ancient bronzes was displayed in the exhibition Musée Rétrospective du Métal, organized in 1880 by the Union Centrale des, des Arts Décoratifs. The aim of the exhibition was to trace the beginning of the use of metals. On that occasion, possible connections between Greek and Chinese bronzes were also evoked. Many members of the Union Centrale des Arts Déco were, like Chernusky, also members of the Société d'Anthropologie de Paris, one of the societies of its kind to be founded in Europe. In the years when Chernusky attended the Société, Gabriel de Mortier, one of the founders of prehistoric archaeology, was its director. In particular, de Mortier devoted himself to the study of the dissemination of the symbol of the cross, one of the oldest symbols of humanity comparing various examples, including some crosses displayed on statues in the Chernusky collection. In the light of what has been said so far, namely Chernusky comparative, archaeological, and anthropological approach to artifacts and objects, 
The enigmatic presence on the facade of the Chernusky Museum of two polychrome ceramic medallions depicting Arist 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 Aristotle. 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 Yes, Aristotle and Leonardo. Well, the, um, Aristotle and Leonardo da Vinci, which, is, which still guard the museum main entrance today, becomes clearer. In the history of the Western aesthetic, both Aristotle and Leonardo were the ultimate models of a line of thought that believed, like Vico, in the hermeneutic value of art and of its techniques. By placing their effig effigies on the facade of his temple of art, Cernusti promoted promoted his conviction that art is science and that through the study of art we can reconstruct the cultures that produced it. In conclusion, as lucidly elaborated in an essay by Stephen Bunn, when a collector dies, when a collection is dispersed, or when the order of the objects within a museum is subverted, we lose the vision of the world and of art that a collector wanted to convey. In other words, we lose the connection to the system of knowledge to which these ensembles referred. I hope that by reconstructing the cultural background that inspired the museum formed by Cavalleri and Cernuschi, I managed to convey, at least in part, the complex cultural motivation behind this collection and the impact that Gian Battista Vico and his anthropological historicism had on 19th century thought and culture. His writings favored a contextual approach to works of art as products to be understood within their specific cultures, an idea that would be developed decades later in the methodology, method, method, methodolo, methodologies, methodologies <laughs> of the School of Vienna of Ernest Cassire and Abi Warburg. Thank you. I found that paper wonderful, surprising, and I knew very little about Cavalieri, if anything, and I think it shows the extraordinary ideas that are current in the Risorgimento when people believe in things that are entirely different, and it's a global view of collecting, which is pretty exciting. We're now going to, it, al it also, as I've been listening to these papers, I've been thinking, well, we've been very much always in Milan, but that went from Milan uh, to uh, Paris. We're now going to hear Susanna Avery Quash from the National Gallery of London talk about Sir Charles Eastlake, the National Gallery, and the Milanese art world of the mid 19th century. Susanna has made, done in, no, wonderful publications on the Eastlakes and their relationship to Italian art. She's senior research curator at the National Gallery of London, in charge of pre-1900 objects in its history collection, and responsible for activities associated with research. Uh, she's published a great deal. She's done exhibitions of considerable consequence. Please welcome Susanna. Grateful thanks to the organisers for the generous invitation to speak today and Jenny for the nice introduction. The first director of the National Gallery, Sir Charles Eastlake's favourite place on earth was probably Venice, with Florence arguably a close second. Indeed, Eastlake thought of acquiring a home in Venice, but for work purposes, it was uh, Milan that won out. In his travel notebooks, Eastlake recorded making 19 separate trips to Milan during his annual tours abroad between 1854 and 1864. Indeed, he visited Milan more often than any other city. Primary sources help us to uh, build together what he was up to there and his contacts in Milan. More unusual records are the journals and correspondence of his wife, Lady Elizabeth Eastlake, who accompanied him on most of his foreign travels. Her memorable written vignettes of some key Milanese personalities add richness and often humour to Eastlake's more factual accounts of paintings. As a gifted amateur artist, Lady Eastlake also made a series of delightful, if little known, drawings of certain paintings, which acted as aid memoir 
studies, several being works, you can see some of them here, of works they saw in Milan. The evidence suggests that Milan was important to Eastlake as a hub on three major interconnected fronts. Firstly, as a place rich in private collections, offering fertile ground to find potential acquisitions. Secondly, as a place where art historical knowledge could be developed, especially in relation to Lombard School and sorting out Leonardo's place and influence on it. And thirdly, as a leading centre of painting conservation. All through three areas were of novel interest to the National Gallery, which at the time, and as a result of a number of governmental special inquiries, and its subsequent reconstitution in 1855, was seeking to become a gallery devoted to the creation of a representative collection of European art from its origins in it in the mid-13th century. The appointment of Eastlake as first director was significant in ringing these changes. He was known as the Alpha and Omega of the Victorian art world, being president of the Royal Academy as well as director of the National Gallery. He was an authority on historical European painting and he had an unrivaled network of European contacts. To assist him with his work, he employed the Bavarian um, art dealer Otto Mundler as travelling agent and Ralph Nicholson Wernham as keeper. Eastlake secured for the first time an annual purchase grant of £10,000 and he followed for the first time a systematic acquisition policy. This ambitious new purchasing strategy explains Eastlake's annual continental tours and his emphasis on targeting important artistic centres with good private collections with pictures for sale, as well as significant public art collections useful for comparative study. He wished to acquire two types of painting. On the one hand, and in line with the gallery's reconstitution, Eastlake was determined to fill in gaps the most glaring of which related to the earliest parts of the collection, especially the Italian school. That new thrust explains Eastlake's interest in Tuscany, where he acquired many examples of early Florentine and Sienese art. On the other hand, Eastlake remained keen to secure masterpieces by already acknowledged painters, or, if that were not possible, to show their networks by acquiring works by their masters, contemporaries, pupils and followers. According to Vasari's great survey of Italian art, the three jewels in Italy's crown were Raphael, Michelangelo and Leonardo. Given that Leonardo had spent two long periods in Milan, that city was the obvious starting point to hunt down works by him and Lombard school painters active there during, before and after Leonardo's time. Eastlake certainly had some catching up to do in relation to Leonardo type acquisitions. The Louvre, which was the National Gallery's nearest rival, could by this point boast five authentic Leonardos, whereas the National Gallery in London had only this one here, uh, a so-called Leonardo, Christ Among the Doctors, now catalogued as by Bernardo Luini, and it had been bequeathed in 1831. The dearth is partly explained by the fact that scholarship concerning Leonardo and the Milanese schools was still in its infancy. A related issue was the lack of relevant works on the market, and that those scattered in private collections were often misattributed. The fact that Lombard artists had frequently produced works in fresco didn't help either, given that the National Gallery saw itself as a repository for oil paintings. Another factor was the existence of proactive European institutional rivals, especially in Paris and Berlin. Eastlake used his evolving networks in Milan, in part, to help find and acquire paintings for London. In terms of art agents, facilitators and dealers, Eastlake deliberately employed local people with insider knowledge of collections and how to access them. He would follow up on the most promising leads provided by Mundler, who saw dozens and dozens of collectors, Pietro Roveselli and Alfonso Reichmann, as Lorenzo Tunesi has already mentioned. Eastlake noted down fewer names, and of the three that crop up most frequently in terms of art agents, Brisson, uh, Giuseppe Baslini, and Giuseppe Montaigne, all Montaigne employed exceptionally fruitful 
relationship with both Eastlake and Mundler, so we'll concentrate on him. Trained originally as a painter, Multaney became involved in the administration side of the Brera, becoming its art advisor or keeper in 1850, its restorer in 1855, and finally director in 1861, a position he maintained until his death in as Janie Anderson first pointed out, given that Eastlake's uh, life followed a similar trajectory at London's National Gallery, their alliance was one between equals. Mundler uh, likewise frequently went to the Brera to see paintings that Molteni had, quote, put aside for him to examine. And the pair worked together um, with others, including Brisson, in 1856 to obtain an export license for the Meltzi Perugino you see here. This protracted episode had an unexpected benefit. In a diary of the 21st of December 1857, Mundler revealed that he had just spent the three previous weeks in Milan waiting for progress on the Perugino uh, negotiation and had spent profit, time profitably thanks to Molteni, quote, not only in viewing the pictures but also in visiting churches and in studying the public collections, which I had every facility in doing owing to the amicable dispositions of the direction of the Brera. Mundler's diary also records associations and occasions when Molteni introduced him to useful contacts. Just to give one of the many examples, on the 20th of January 1856, they dined together and Molteni uh, made him the acquaintance, um, uh, uh, Mundler says, of another member of the academy, uh, Professor d'Archeologia um, Cavallari, a Sicilian, who told me the most interesting and important notices on Sicilian artists and on Florentine, Venetian and other pictures to be found in Sicily, in the Abruzzi and so on. A sense of indebtedness presumably explains why Mundler spent time, quote, in choosing a present for Molteni. Molteni's um, Milanese atelier, is established in 1824, the same year that the National Gallery was founded, became a lively meeting place for artists, collectors, connoisseurs, dealers, and museum officials from across Europe. Lady Eastlake noted uh, as much after one visit in 1858, from a very long quotation I just quote here, he is adored by numerous friends who drop in at all times to his studio and can't live without Molteni. One of these friends is a Conte Taverni, another is a young Marchese Poldi, famed for his enormous wealth, who would never know how to kill his time without Molteni's jokes. <laughs> of Eastlake's interactions with Gian Giacomo Poldi Pezzoli, we know that the Eastlakes visited him on the 22nd of August, 1858, from another written description by Lady Eastlake, where she noted, among other things, charming pictures, beautiful things in metal, gilding, and all the works of the Milanese workmen who may compete over the world. She, she understood his patriotic um, imperative to patronise contemporary craftsmen. The absence of any description of the collection in our husband's notebooks is, I think, explicable when we recall that the Count's old master collection was then still in, in its infancy and that Eastlake would have recognised that Paul de Petzeli, wishing to build up rather than diminish his nascent historical art collection, was more of a competitor on the art market than a possible partner in business. Indeed, Paul de Petzli would show interest in this work here, Dirk Boots's entombment. Eastlake had seen the work in 1858 in the home of the Milanese diplomat, Count Diego Guizzardi, noting that it was priced at 200 pounds, and that was in treaty for it. Ultimately, the National Gallery acquired it in 1860. Other entries in Eastlake's notebooks concerning the Poldi Petzli collection are interesting, and I thought I'd just give you a flavour for this particular And they show Eastlake's connoisseurship in practice, the way he was able to compare a painting in front of him with others stored in his remarkable visual memory bank. For instance, when studying the collection of Baron Speck von Sternberg near Leipzig in Germany in, in August 1859, a very fine echo homo there by Solario brought to Eastlake's mind other works scattered across Europe. The artist signed Small Holy Family belonging to the um, Cavaliere Poldi in Milan, quote unquote Eastlake, a reference to the rest on the flight into Egypt of 1515. 
as well as the Coussin Vert in the Louvre. A second case is interesting too. In 1861, when thinking about the characteristics of Zenale's painting style, Eastlake compared a known work of Zenale working with Butenone in Treviglio with a virgin and child, and he quotes, the Madonna with a curious, disagreeable headdress belonging to Paul di Pezzoli. Um, and it's currently here, currently unattributed, so perhaps it's worth recalling that Eastlake, at least, observed that it has all the character of Zenale. As Alessandro Morandotti, among others, has pointed out, through first-hand general, uh, ge the generation of connoisseurs like Eastlake, Mundell and Morelli, um, through together looking at first-hand inspection of the works of art and discussion among themselves, they were responsible for shaping local Lombard art history in a new scholarly direction, bringing to bear up-to-date scholarly knowledge from a Europe-wide lens, which the local Milanese antiquarians then lacked, as they hadn't travelled quite so widely, and so didn't know and couldn't compare works in Milanese collections with other major collections elsewhere. So uh, one example of a collection that Eastlake and Mundler found to have exaggerated over optimistic attributions was in that of Count Carlo Cas Castelbarco Visconti Simonetta, which uh, although Eastlake noted that there were some fine portraits and one or two pictures by early obscure masters inscribed. In fact, Eastlake went on to bid for six Castelbarco paintings in September 1864. One work that he succeeded purchasing immediately was Altobello Melone's Road to Emmaus, show you here, while a second, the Bartolomeo Montagna's Virgin and Child, he bought five years later. In two other celebrated Milanese collections, those amassed by the Lita and Melpsi dynasties, Eastlake felt bold enough to question attributions to Leonardo. Although he found the Lita Madonna, now in St. Petersburg, charming, the head of the Christ grand and that of the Madonna beautiful, he did not feel in the end it was by Leonardo, noting it ha has not sufficient impasto and exquisite as it is in some details in the ornaments, not so precise as Leonardo is in certain works. See sketch by Lady E. Well, Lady Eastlake also uh, sketched you can see the work there that she did. And she also sketched um, two other works from the Lita collection, which Eastlake didn't pursue, which are now in the Poldi Petzli. The Lita Beltrafio, which Eastlake let go because the Madonna with her very short arm is very objectionable, but the child is charming. And Luini's Mystic Marriage of St. Catherine, which Eastlake summed up as a repainted, spotty, and injured, but otherwise charming Luini. I just show you her album because it came to light a few years ago, and it's a beautiful um, work that we can compare with Eastlake's notebooks, but it's not very well known. In terms of the two side panels of Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks, then in the Meltzi collection, interestingly, Eastlake and Mundler differed in their views, and as the director's opinion counted for more, his views prevailed, at least initially. Whereas Mundler concluded, quote, everything considered, there is no great probability of any great picture li likely to turn up more deserving of so great a name than these two pictures are. Eastlake, by contrast, dismissed them as in different works by followers of Leonardo. Both are very coarse, he said, and quite unworthy of Leonardo. The best is in the manner of Ogione, and the other is like Salaino. The gallery did acquire both panels, but only under its third director, Sir Frederick Burton, almost half a century later. Burton was also responsible for purchasing Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks, a work, interestingly, that Eastlake had attempted in vain to pursue, as I found out, when he looked that it looked like it might come up for sale in England as early as 1851. Eastlake constantly keen to push the boundaries of art history, yet cautious about using public money wisely, was attracted to authentically signed paintings. And so I just wanted to give a couple of examples, which I think explains why he was happy to purchase certain works in Milan. So for example, he, he purchased both A Virgin and Child by Mantegna 
from Count um, Somalia's collection that we've seen earlier today from the uh, Palazzo Malerio in Milan in 1855 and to pay over the odds in 1863 for a signed and dated portrait by Solario discovered that year in the Casa Lampugnano in uh, Milan. The portrait of Giovanni Cristoforo Longoni had the added advantages that the sitter's name was recorded on it and Eastlake said it was in excellent preservation. As Morandotti has pointed out, an important aspect of Eastlake's network in Milan was its promotion of a novel way of working in which a close group of individuals was willing and able to exchange opinions freely for the benefit of developing an empirical art history, especially for Italian painting. I think that Eastlake's encounter with Giovanni Morelli in Milan, Morelli had a house on the Via Pontaccio, was critical for them both. Although Morelli's pioneering attributional technique would only fully be published in Die Werke Italienische Meister in 1880, we know, of course, from Janie's work and others, that he was developing his methodology during the 1860s, when Eastlake was in regular touch with him. And I just wanted to point out an obvious um, point that I think that Eastlake's tiny little drawings um, of details such as fingernails, eyes, ears and so on that pepper his notebooks, I just show you one example here, are best understood as visual and early equivalents to Morelli's increasing focus on similar minor details of an artist's distinctive style as determining factors when making attributions. Lady Eastlake published a lengthy piece about uh, Morelli after his death in the quarterly review, part obituary and part commendation of Morellian scholarship. In it, she laid out five principles by which he and others like her husband had worked to shed light on the authorship of pictures. And I quote, they did this by first, by intuition, secondly, by a knowledge of the technical processes which the accredited works uh, by the same master exhibit, Thirdly, by the signature of a painter on his own work. Fourthly, by books and documents and every form of historical record. Fifthly, by tradition. And I think she might have added, sixthly, by scholarly interchange and exchange, as both Morelli and Eastlake had spent much time in person or through correspondence debating attributions, dates and so on amongst themselves and their circle of trusted colleagues or as Lady Eastlake characterised Morelli's circle, a large number of friends, Italian, German and English. There are numerous record recorded exchanges between all of the circle, but for, for now I'm just concentrating on Morelli, Molteni, Eastlake and Mundler um, over attributions, both in regard to the Lombard School and paintings from other artistic uh, schools in Milan's public art collections. In relation to the former, we might recall, for instance, how Morelli supplied Eastlake with notes relating to Bramantino, a painter whose work uh, continued the tradition of the pre-Lombardesque Milanese uh, painting of Utanone and Foppa. Again, Morelli helped Mundler with his research into Bramantino, research that presumably assisted Mundler's attribution of that master's work and adoration of the, of the kings, now in the National Gallery's collection. There was certainly nothing that satisfied the group more than sorting out previous uh, confusions concerning the identity of painters and therefore um, making their accepted of more complete. In relation to the Lombard School, we may cite a couple of indicative episodes in Eastlake's contribution. He helped to work out that Bergagnone was one and the same artist as Ambrogio da Faso Fossano and, like Mundler, used a signed work by Solario depicting the rest on the flight into Egypt with Joseph offering the Christ child a pair, which he encountered at Molteni's studio in 1857 and which Lavinia tells me he discussed at the same time with Paul Di Pezzoli to prove that Andrea Mediolanus and Solario are one and the same, quote Eastlake. All of Eastlake's discoveries about the Milanese painters were fed into the National Gallery's constantly updated Foreign Schools catalogue a publication that was soon acknowledged across Europe as a model of accuracy, impartiality and comprehensiveness. One novelty introduced by Eastlake into these publications was the reproduction of artist signatures. In relation to the Milanese school, for example, Lanino's signature uh, was reproduced for the first time in the catalogue in 1864 and the year, uh, the year before Eastlake died, while that of Solario 
was first reproduced in an edition of 1870. Mundler's connoisseurship was equally vital in this area, if I think of more direct benefit to uh, their Milanese colleagues, as Mundler focused time and attention for years on their collections. As I think a critical friend to the Brera, Mundler helped over many months with revising its catalogue, a revealing diary entry for the 17th of January 1856, noting that he'd been through the Brera with Molteni, quote, communicating all my observations made in 1844, in 1853, 1855 and 1856. Mundler also reported that he had worked on, on a more recent group of pictures, the Ojone bequest of 1855, um, quoting, baptizing the pictures after he'd rejected um, over half the names um, that they came with. I think maybe of all of your attributions at the Brera, at least one of them, Mundler was very proud of linking Correggio's name with the adoration of the Magi you see here. And just to give you a sense of the longer quotations from his diaries, um, I quote at length um, um, a rather charming um, the episode he, he describes on the 12th of March, 1856, uh, with joyful drama about this painting. A rainy day, Brera, examined with Signor Molteni, the picture signed Antonus Latus Facebat, which I always considered as an original picture. Found my impressions quite correct, and Cavaliere Molteni abundantly sharing my conviction. Professore um, Mongeri, Cavaliere, and some other persons join in to enjoy this new discovery. This is an important yet overlooked reference, as Abrera's website credits the reattribution of the work to Beren Berenson. So I think we should put that back to Mindler. <laughs> Describing her husband's research and acquisitions for the National Collection, Lady Eastlake noted in 1858 that it was all very interesting and it will give the public new names and wider ideas. Thanks to the concerted efforts of Eastlake, Mundler and their close-knit circle in Milan, efforts which were continued by the next two directors, William Boxall and Frederick Burton, the group of Milanese painters that adopted Leonardo's manner, whether appropriating his compositional motifs or responding to his painterly effects, I'm thinking of Boltrafio, um, uh, Bramantino, Cesare da Sesto, Gianpietrino, Luini, Marco Dogione, uh, Martino Piazza, De Predis, and Solario are now well represented in the National Gallery, while those painters who remained immune to Leonardo's influence also first became visible in London, at least, during Eastlake's directorship. Well, having touched on Eastlake's picture acquisition, and developing connoisseurship in Milan, the thir thir third and final area we need just to mention is picture restoration, given that Milan, for a time at least, became the place where Eastlake chose to have many new acquisitions, whether purchased in Milan or not, restored there before they were shipped back to London for display. Restoration was a key aspect of connoisseurship for Eastlake, who felt that dirty varnish and botched restorations needed to be removed so that the original master's hand could be recognised and in turn utilised to aid further attributional work. The choice of Milan as the hub for restoration was deliberate. So I've taken a look at the, the history of restoration um, at the National Gallery. Eastlake, I think, selected it partly as a place that was out of the immediate public view after the second of his pioneering cleaning campaigns in London when keeper of the National Gallery that had backfired in 1846. He chose Milan as a place he thought was in the vanguard of restoration for early Italian pictures, having experienced some less positive experiences earlier on using restorers in other Italian cities. For example, Alberto Andrea Italia Pietra in Venice and Ugo Baldi in Florence. Then avoiding such Milanese firms as Fidanza and Sun, which by mid-century was renowned for its forgeries, and using Brisson just once in 1856, as we noted over the Melzi Perugino triptych, from 1857 for several years, the gallery's restoration work was monopolized by Giuseppe Molteni, starting with The Virgin and Child and Two Angels, recently acquired in Volterra as a work by um, Gilandio in 1857. But in terms, to keep things concise, uh, today in terms of Eastlake's Milanese school acquisitions, Molteni worked in 1858 on Bergagnone's Virgin Child with Saints, together with Mundler, and in 1863 on Solario's portrait of Giovanni Cristoforo Longoni. 
Additionally, Molteni worked on pictures for Eastlake Aquadra's own personal art collection, notably four works that he had purchased from the Costabile collection. And Molteni, of course, was also employed to clean pictures owned by Poldi Petzli and Eastlake's acquaintance, Sir, Char uh, Sir Austin Henry Layard. From the investigations of scholars, including Janey, we know that Molteni was involved in adding, patination, retouching certain areas, and most notoriously to us today, correcting perceived faults, something, of course, modern attitudes would never countenance. I've just time to draw particular attention to one area, um, and I thought that was most important to our discussions today because it concerns the network and the multiple roles that individuals played and it also underscores what Matthew Hayes' recent investigations have revealed about Eastlake's certainly complicated calculations uh, on occasion when employing Molteni as a restorer. So just to give one example of several, um, when that Solaria painting I show you here was bought, Eastlake confided to Wernham in a letter, so it shows the importance of archives, that, quote, as Molteni was greatly instrumental in promoting the purchase of this, I could do no less than leave the picture with him to be restored, but in fact it requires little to be done. The cost of this cosmetic restoration cost the British government 40 pounds and 11 shillings, no small amount in those days. So, having given some headline information concerning Eastlake's work in Milan, what can we conclude about his achievements? And I thought perhaps we could compare it with his modus operandi in other European cities in order to say something conclusive. Uh, arguably, the works Eastlake acquired from Milanese private collections are on a level with early Italian paintings purchased elsewhere. So, for example, we might say that the Melzi Perugino or the Somalia on Mantegna certainly hold their own against Bellini's Madonna of the Meadows or Piero's Baptism. That Eastlake experienced delays with indecisive Milanese owners, such as Count Melzi over the Perugino triptych, is no different from the situation elsewhere. In fact, it appears that Eastlake probably experienced greater difficulties elsewhere, as in 1855, when he was finally unable to export a Ghirlandaio he had legally purchased in Florence, or when in 1857 he struggled in Rome to export works by Antonio Viverini. Some of the works acquired from Milan perhaps would not have left Italy had greater attention been paid to the export processes, but from the evidence as far as I can see, nothing as egregious happened in Milan as took place over the export of works in other cities, notably Carlo Crivelli's Madonna della Rondine from Metellica in the Marche. So given what I've argued, is there anything particularly distinctive about Eastlake's activities in Milan? Well, I think you'll be glad to hear my answer is a definitive yes. Uh, and in essence, I think the answer concerns the quality and quantity of the time he invested in Milan. So other important centres in Italy were frequently visited, but there are no real contenders in terms of the time he spent there. For instance, we've all mentioned Turin today, but I, I counted it up, and he, it was an often visited centre, but the nine visits to Turin don't compare with the 19 that he made to Milan. And a related critical point is the experts he managed to engage with in Milan. Above all, there are many, many names, but we've looked today at a, a, tr a trio, Basilini, Morelli, Molteni. They became key parts of Eastlake and Mundler's inner circle of trusted advisors, and who, as respected leaders and pioneers in the field, helped the two British P um, museum directors uh, achieve their goals. Whether in relation to acquiring works through the art market, attributing and dating works, using evolving methods of connoisseurship, or carrying out state-of-the-art restoration of pictures newly acquired for Britain's national collection. Basilini, Morelli, Molteni remained friendly towards the National Gallery throughout Eastlake's direct decade as director, despite some conflicts of interest arising after unification in 1861, when several Italians, given the new official roles, were involved in saving Italy's artistic heritage from decay and export. But what emerges from this account is just how interconnected and international the mid-19th century art world was and how great an impact, in particular, Eastlake's Milanese network had on the evolving collections, especially of Italian art, in Britain's national collection. Thank you very much.
extraordinary archive that we have at the National Gallery of London. We've talked about Lombard archives, but the National Gallery of London has extraordinary things. And uh, it, it certainly brought out. Um, there are lots and lots of things I could discuss in your paper. Do you, do you, I mean, it's just one trick question. With the unification in 1861, I mean, it was said it was easier for itself to get things out of the uh, through the land because of the Austro-Hungarian indifference to uh, the exportation of works of art from Italy. Is there any truth in that, do you think? Or? I think so, but, but I think also because Isaac was um, ahead of the curve, yes. um, he was forging a trail that um, wasn't um, overpopulated. So I think he was able to get work out also because people weren't on the case. So when Boxall, his successor, took over, he said, Jamie, um, you know, I find it very, very hard not only to, to trust some of Isaac's colleagues because of the change of government and ideas, but also because the export laws have also tightened up because of the nationalism. So it was this sense of things locking down. Um, people realised that um, uh, Isaac and other international museum directors were, were hemorrhaging the Italian patrimony. And um, finally, because of this um, concerted national effort, uh, the foreigners um, were, were you know, found it increasingly difficult uh, because I, I think there were more people around, things were being published, they could see what's on the walls of these international galleries. And I think there was a mood change um, from both That's directions. That's what I've always understood, but I wonder if well, thank you. Are we going to have a break now for coffee? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, how okay, welcome back to the last session of the day. Eloise Donnelly is going to talk under the rather extraordinary title of Sweeping Up the Best Things. Uh, South Museum's dealings in Milan, 1860 to 1900. Uh, she's the assistant curator of decorative art and sculpture at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, where she works on 19th and early 20th century works of art and the history of collecting. Her PhD is entitled Collecting Renaissance Decorative Art in Britain, 1850 to 1914. It's a terribly important subject for the history of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And sometimes the Poldi is called a small v &A. I don't know whether you like that or not, but um, Alessandro used to sometimes say, we are a small v &A. Uh, When I was working on Morelli, I did find this ambitious letter from Cole, uh, Sir Henry Cole, who was director of the museum, wanting to buy the Arena Chapel in Padua. He was not successful. Please welcome Melody. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction, Janie, and thank you so much to Lavinia, to Alessandra, and to Sylvia for organising such a stimulating and interesting uh, study day today. Um, can everyone hear me at the back of the room? Is that better? Can everyone hear me? Great. Okay. In 1862, the curator of the South Kensington Museum, John Charles Robinson, traveled to Rome via Turin, Milan, Bologna, and Florence, seeking out potential acquisitions. Still in its first decade, the museum was acutely aware that its holdings were lagging behind those of its European rivals, and it was anxious to expand the collections. Robinson's report back to South Kensington reveals a sense of urgency that was to become a feature of the museum's foreign acquisitions throughout the second half of the 19th century. He recounted that, during the course of my journey, certain objects presented themselves which it seemed very desirable not to lose, and, as the only means of securing these specimens was to purchase them at once, I did so at my own risk and liability. While the rapid development of the London art market offered a ready supply of objects for sale, fears of missing out on important objects or of paying inflated prices 
meant that travelling to acquire objects directly from local dealers formed a critical aspect of the South Kensington Museum's collecting strategy from its inception in 1852. Sir Philip Cunliffe Owen, who was the director of the museum between 1874 and 1893, suggested that John Charles Robinson should be sent to Italy in 1881 to take advantage of opportunities to buy, as, quote, by Mr. Robinson's superior knowledge, he can sweep up the best things, which would otherwise only filter through Paris, perhaps Berlin, to London at an increased rate. The primacy of Italian Renaissance objects, as well as the relative expense of shipping decorative art, furniture and sculpture from Italy to London, meant that Italy became the focal point of these curatorial shopping trips. Curators were primarily drawn, drawn to Florentine curiosity shops and dealers, and the museum's activities there with dealers, including Stefano Bardini, have been documented extensively by scholars, including Clive Wainwright and Lynn Cattism but the museum's interactions in other Italian cities has received less attention. So today's conference, celebrating Paul di Pezzoli and the Milanese art market, has provided the opportunity to focus in on the museum's activities in Milan. So in this paper, I hope to reconstruct the museum's connections with Milan and illuminate key dealer-curator relationships to consider the role that Milan had in shaping the collections at South Kensington. After a brief overview of curatorial trips to Milan, I will focus in on two dealers who developed lasting connections with the South Kensington Museum. Firstly, Giuseppe Baslini, about whom we have already heard today and we'll be hearing about uh, shortly from Martina, and the Fratelli Mora. By focusing in on these individual objects acquired from these dealers, I hope to demonstrate how these Milanese acquisitions reflect some of the key concerns shaping museum buying at this time thereby situating the Milanese art market in which Poldi Pezzoli operated within a pan-European context. So what was the museum's experience of visiting Milan? Curators started travelling to Milan to acquire objects in the museum's first decade. As well as John Charles Robinson's visit to Milan in 1862, Henry Cole, head of the Department of Science and Art and the architect of the Great Exhibition, travelled to Milan in 1868, recording in his diaries at Baslini, the dealer, bought several objects and looked at others and noted. Though so having established relationships with dealers on these visits, information, sketches and photographs of potential acquisitions would then be sent back to the museum for consideration. It's worth noting that curators seeking to fill the galleries at South Kensington were not only interested in acquiring historic objects on these trips, but they were also seeking out objects for which casts and copies could be made. And Francesca touched on this earlier in her um, paper um, on exhibitions that casts and copies were um, seen as an important part of, of collecting as, as much as the historic objects. Between the 1860s and the 1880s, the museum acquired 13 casts of 14th and 15th century sculpture and architectural pieces from Lombardy, cast by the Milanese maker Pietro Pierotti, and here you can see his cast of Mantegazza's Lamentation of the Dead Christ. The museum's shopping trips gathered pace in the 1880s, as the artist Frederick Layton observed in a letter to the museum in 1889, quote, in the old days when there was li very little competition, a museum like yours could afford to sit at home to a certain extent. Now, competition is very keen and very intelligent. Thomas Armstrong, who was the keeper of fine art at the museum between 1881 and 1898, made two visits to Milan in 1884 and 1885. His correspondence details long visits, long days visiting dealers and trying to secure acquisitions, as he informed the director of the museum in a letter from Milan in February 1884. I have seen many more fine things than we can sure afford to buy. This morning, I went to look after the huge carved doorway which still stands in the Piazza Santa Maria della Grazia. I had a bit of a hope that old Molinari, the owner of it, would make some advance to us and offer to sell at a reduced price, but he does not seem to have taken any. The Guardian says he himself heard 120,000 lira offered for it. It is a fine thing and I should like to have it. Armstrong also visited private collections, and although his visits took place after the death of Bordi Pezzoli, he was particularly affected, affected by a visit to the immersive interiors of the house of the Bugatti Valsecchi brothers. Writing back to the museum, he reports, I have been to see the Bugatti's house, and now I am very glad I stayed, for it is simply one of the most interesting in Italy. I did not think any Italians could make such a house, 
or would care to do so if they could. The beautiful ceilings, chimney pieces and doors collected in the towns of North Italy are admirably put together and the house does not look at all like a curiosity shop. And the comment I think is revealing both for the curator's enthusiasm about the period room style approach to collections, which was not an approach adopted at South Kensington, um, but also about his assumptions about Italian taste um, versus, for example, French precedents of immersive interiors about which um, we heard uh, this morning in, in Paul's contribution. A major theme emerging from the museum's trips to Milan are concerns around fakes, forgeries, and of being taken advantage of by dealing rings and unscrupulous merchants. And as we heard from Luca this morning, these concerns were also very clearly operating around Italy, also in the Florentine market. In advance of a trip to Italy in 1882, Robinson noted that, quote, whoever goes should be well up in the current Italian forgeries of works of art. After a day exploring curiosity shops in Milan in 1885, Armstrong wrote back to the museum that he had seen a plate which he desired to buy. Perhaps I may leave a commission for it, he writes, but there is a ring here, and if I were to approach the sale, they would certainly mark me up. In the same letter, he also records the downfall of a Milanese collector whose collection was shortly to be sold in Milan, and who, quote, has reduced himself by drunken habits to a state bordering on idiocy, and probably some dealer has taken advantage of his want of money. So this sense of wariness, of caution, and of risk really pervades the museum's dealings in Milan, and it's for this reason that the personal connections that curators forged with individual dealers was key to developing the trust necessary to make secure and much-needed acquisitions. And so I'll go on now to discuss two examples of these. The earliest established relationship between the museum and a Milanese dealer is that with Giuseppe Baslini. Both John Charles Robinson and Henry Cole visited his shop in the 1860s. And by the 1880s, Armstrong acknowledged that Baslini, quote, really controls all dealings in bric-a-brac in Milan. Certainly, the museum benefited from his buying power. Acquisitions from Baslini feature across the museum collections with examples of painting, sculpture, furniture, and metalwork. Baslini was clearly sensitive to the museum's collecting priorities and he worked to satisfy their demands for works of the Italian Renaissance. This connection was established with the museum's first documented acquisition in 1869, which was described as a 14th century Florentine marble bust of a Roman judge. It's priced at 1,500 francs. Matthew Digby Wyatt, who was the architect, who was then acting as a referee for the museum, described it as, quote, certainly a good work of art, characterized by serene gravity of expression much to be admired and he commented on the reasonableness of the price, which was a key reason why buying directly from Italian dealers was seen as so important. Although the bust is actually later than Digby White assumed, dating to 1570 to 90, and now attributed to the Bolognese sculpture Lazzaro Casario, it depicts the papal judge Giovanni Andrea Calderini, and is part of a series of eight busts which were recorded in the Calderini Palace in Bologna during the 18th century. And so it was an important acquisition for the museum's collections, both in terms of its artistic and its historic significance. 1869 also saw the accession of three objects from Baslini, from the celebrated collection formed by Serafino Tordelli at Spoleto, which Baslini had acquired on block in October 1868 for 60,000 lira. Bruno Toscano and Bianco Maria Fratellini have suggested that these acquisitions were made through Tordelli's nephew, the architect Giovanni Monteroli, who had connections in England through his work for the Dukes of Northumberland and Marlborough. However, we know that these connections between the museum curators and Baslini had already been established through their in-person visits to Milan, and that Baslini was aware of the museum's collecting preferences. One of these objects acquired by the museum from the Tordelli collection was a mid-15th century Umbrian Cassoni panel, which related directly to one that was already in the museum collections, having been acquired in 1863. The panel, acquired in 1863, features the arms of the Della Torre and Poccioli families, tying it, and thus its matching panel, to the historic past, and it features its original stand. So an important object in itself, but more valuable uh, with its pair. The panel was bought by the museum for 20 pounds, and was of particular iconographical interest to curators, as it depicted a contemporary marriage scene, as opposed to a classical myth expressing virtue and fidelity, like those already in the collections. 
Interestingly, the panel bought from Badlini was also documented as retaining its original stand when it had been catalogued in the Tordelli collection. So uh, it must have been um, altered prior to the sale. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, the earlier panel, it's been suggested that this was also acquired from Baslini. Um, I haven't found documentation to, to support this, but that's um, been put forward. A second acquisition from the Tordelli collection was this diptych, representing the Virgin and Child with Saints in the Crucifixion, attributed by Donald Cooper to the Master of Sandalo, dating to the 1320s. A hollowed out area in the center holds relics still in place, which was a rare survival for reliquary diptychs, and so added to the appeal of the object for South Kensington curators. Boscovitz attributed the diptych to an early 14th century Spoletan circle, which included the master of the Poldi Pezzoli diptych, connecting the acquisition to Milanese collecting taste. Finally, the museum acquired a bronze mortar from the Tordelli collection, which features coats of arms and inscriptions dating to 1468 and that was acquired for £24 in December 1868. So the museum's collecting priorities, these high-status Renaissance objects with both artistic and historic significance, are borne out in the Tordelli acquisitions bought through Baslini. Alongside these acquisitions, Baslini donated a later object to the museum, a bronze medal depicting the Basilica and Fountain of Santa Maria in Trastevere in Rome, dated 1663 and set into a locket which one can imagine was a commercial strategy designed to cement these dealer-curator relationships. Indeed, the same year, he donated a tondo frame, which you can see here, which is possibly the one a note records as Henry Cole having identified previously as an acquisition on during a previous visit. The strategy seems to have worked as the museum went on to acquire objects from Baslini in the 1870s and 1880s, including the acquisition in 1878 an important marble relief depicting the lamentation of the, over the dead Christ, dating to 1470, which is part of an altarpiece carved by Bartolomeo Balano. Edward Pointer, the painter who was acting as a consultant for the museum at that time, described the relief as, quote, a remarkably fine specimen of religious art at the school of Donatello, and declaring it to be a most desirable acquisition for the museum, while Robinson also recommended its immediate purchase at the price of 300 pounds. It's worth noting that alongside these important objects acquired by the museum, Baslini offered a large number of other objects which were not acquired, and really this is when we see the museum's concerns with fakes, forgeries, and composite pieces really come to the fore. A group of iron objects, including two fire dogs, a shovel, and some tongs, were rejected as having had modern alterations of quite inferior art and workmanship, and as a group of disparate objects brought together artificially to be sold as a set. One of the main themes to come out of the museum's interactions with Baslini concerns the authenticity of the objects they were offered. Baslini offered a large salver in silver gilt to the museum in 1869, which was priced at 11,200 francs, which was, in reality, an electrotype copy. A group of 47 pieces of maiolica, including examples by Maestro Giorgio and Zanto, which had come from the Tordelli collection, were also rejected as the ceramics expert, Joseph Marriott, was skeptical about the originality of the pieces with so many fakes circulating on the market at that time, warning in his report that, quote, it is well known that spurious articles of Maiolica are extensively manufactured in Italy, the imitation being so perfect as to deceive the most experienced judges. Um, and I think this was particularly um, significant in the case of South Kensington because they were sensitive to criticism of public funds being, being spent on objects that could later be found to be fakes, as, as Susanna uh, uh, referenced with the National Gallery also earlier. Um, it's worth noting that an example from the Tordelli collection did actually enter the museum collections later through the Salting Bequest in 1910. Indeed, some of these fakes and forgeries seem to be specific to Milan, when Baslini offered the museum a trestle table in Lever the Ivory for 1,100 francs, D.B. Wyatt remarked that, quote, for some time past, the Milanese have been getting hold of old plain walnut tabletops and slabs of scarcely any value, and then covering them with lavoro certosino, which they execute with such perfection as to almost defy detection. I suspect that the tabletop, and possibly the trestles also, have been so dealt with. These doubts were clearly allayed as the object was acquired by the museum later in 1869.
So moving on, the second dealer um, I want to discuss uh, are the Mora family. This dynasty of art collectors, dealers, and makers had premises both in Milan as well as at Bergamo, where they had a factory producing contemporary furniture inspired by, and in many cases copied directly from, historic objects in their collection. This approach of applying historic designs and craftsmanship to contemporary objects chimed perfectly with the museum's own ethos of collecting objects with the aim of inspiring contemporary makers. And it's an ideology uh, that lay behind the organization of many exhibitions, as Francesca um, talked about earlier. The relationship seems to have become established in 1890, when the museum acquired a number of chairs made by Fratelli Mora, which had been copied from historic prototypes. Luigi Mora traveled to South Kensington to make the sale, taking instructions from curators as to the specific finish of the object. One, for example, was to be covered with green velvet instead of leather, while another chair was to be provided with a leather cover, like that in the original form from which it is copied. The Mora company supplied both the stuffs and an Italian cabinet maker to achieve the desired finish, so there's certainly um, a degree of status um, and trust in uh, Milanese contemporary craftsmanship. Yet having initially established the relationship through the purchase of contemporary furniture, the majority of the museum's dealings with the Mora family were actually in the form of the purchase of historic objects, which were, according to Mora, all the more valuable from the present scarcity of ancient objects of artistic interest. Mora described their collection as objects of art antiques and forming part for more than 100 years of the museum belonging to our family, thereby elevating the objects from a commercial enterprise to the status of a private museum collection an idea embodied in the richly variegated display of the collection in the rooms of their own home, redolent of the historic past, an idea suggested also by their letterhead. In 1897, the curator Arthur Banks Skinner visited the collection, making notes of the contents of each room. This display and arrangement of the collection clearly appealed to Thomas Armstrong when he visited, in Milan, visited Milan in November 1890. You will recall his delight at visiting the Bugatti Valsecchi brothers, and he identified a number of objects for purchase, ranging from a pair of bellows inlaid with mother of pearl, to an iron door knocker, a soup tureen, an iron lantern, an inlaid coffer, which was, was thought to be Italian, but now is identified as Spanish, and a circular piece of embossed leather, the objects acquired by Armstrong on this first trip reflect the variety of the Mora Brothers collection. A prayer desk, identified by Armstrong as a potential acquisition, was not acquired as the brothers, quote, decided not to sell, although the museum did manage to secure the purchase two years later. Here you can see it. Certainly, the acquisitions from Fratelli Mora build on the museum's concern with expanding the, the holdings of Renaissance art objects. And as we have seen, this was the main priority in their interactions with Baslini. In 1891, two Quattrocento Maiolica dishes, which are now dated to the 17th century, and a ewer were purchased by Armstrong to fill gaps in the collection. And indeed, like Baslini, the Mora seemed to identify gaps in the museum collections, sending, for example, photographs of a series of wood sculptures dating from to the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries as the museum, quote, possesses few examples of early, early figure carvings in wood. Similarly, they offered pieces missing from the museum collections, but present in their rivals, such as a coffer front with gilt gesso, the same design as one in the Berlin Museum, and having been illustrated in Boulder's catalogue, or a piece of painted terracotta of the first half of the 15th century, in which the Berlin Museum was particularly rich, but which was not represented at South Kensington. Indeed, in 1902, the Mora brothers offered the museum a comprehensive collection of leatherwork dating from the 14th to the 17th century with Italian, German, and French examples, suggesting that they collated collections specifically for the museum market in a similar way to Bardini. In addition to historic objects, Armstrong also identified objects which could be copied by the Mora brothers for the museum, such as a parcel gilt hat stand originating from a church outside Bergamo for whom the Mora brothers had already supplied a replica. An invoice from 1892 shows that the museum bought both an original fold stool and a contemporary copy at the same time for 500 and 250 lira respectively. And they also bought historic door knockers, modern variations, and a carved wood model of a door knocker too, demonstrating the museum's concern with process. 
But it's also worth noting that the, these curators were not only buying with a view to the collections at South Kensington. Following the establishment of the Edinburgh and the Dublin Museums of Science and Art in 18, 1866 and 1877, respectively, buying trips were also undertaken with a view to expanding the branch museums and the circulating collections. When Arthur Bank Skinner visited the Mora Brothers on a trip to Italy in 1908, he identified a complete room, quote, French with painted roof, gilded and panelled in the factory at Bergamo as a potential purchase for a regional museum, while a, a pair of carved doors, quote, might do for Dublin. Thus, the legacy of the museum's relationship with the Fratelli Mora and with the Milanese art market spreads far beyond London. So to conclude, the museum's interactions with these dealers act as a snapshot into the concerns that shaped their buying in the second half of the 19th century and demonstrate the role that Milan played in the development of the museum collections. While these dealers did not make as critical a contribution to the museum collections in terms of the sheer number of objects or in terms of the amount of money spent as those from Florence, Milan was clearly an, an important stopping place on the museum's buying trips and the relationships forged there with Basilini and the Fratelli Mora led to a succession of important acquisitions that filled gaps in the museum's collections. These relationships were particularly important due to the scepticism about the authenticity of objects bought and the risk of buying faked and forged pieces. The Mora brothers in particular seem to have chimed directly with the museum's ethos in terms of their own contributions to contemporary design as makers and also in their role providing casts and reproduction areas of contemporary making in which the museum had a particular interest. Thus, while there seems to be no reference specifically to Paul di Bezzoli himself in the archives at South Kensington, there were clearly strong links with the city in which he operated and rich points of connection between South Kensington and the Milan in which he lived. Thank you. Okay, it was all? Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, well, the next speaker is Olga Piccolo, and she has a, a PhD from the University of Bergamo and other earlier degrees in medieval art history from the State University of Milan. She's the author of a lot of articles on um, collecting, and particularly uh, she's an expert on Cavalcaselli. She's also unusual in this conference in being a collaborator of the Italian Ministry of Culture, in which she supports the Export Office and the Archive of Historical Constraints on Movable Heritage of the Milan Sovereintendenza. So she's actually now involved in the sorts of things that we're talking about in a way that no other uh, person has been. <laughs> So uh, please welcome Olga, thank you. Grazie, è un po' difficile parlare dopo madrelingua, però provo a parlare in inglese. Okay. I would like to thank Professor Ginny Anderson for her introduction, the conference committee, the museum management for their hospitality. All the people who helped me with the research and the Milano Superintendenza for their cooperation. The research I am presenting is based on the examination of Cavalcaselli's unpublished manuscript dedicated to Milano, kept at the Biblioteca Nazionale Marciana in Venice and the National Library of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. For London, in particular, was a relevant examination of the 22 boxes of materials by Crow and Cavalcaselli that have been studied only recently. These documents were compared with the transcription of the minute of the history of painting in North Italy, edited by Donata Levi, and are currently being published. I will begin with the drawing already made known by Mauro Natale and Andrea Di Lorenzo that Cavalcaselli drew from the Paul di Pezzoli Museum's iconic portrait of a young lady painted by Piero del Pollaiolo, seen in Milano together with other artworks in the Borromeo collection. The sheet is relevant in that it documents for the first time in a period between 1864 to 68 the presence of the work in the Borromeo collection uh, with the added indication veduta nel 1875 da Poldi seen in 1875 in the Poldi collection. The lady was in fact sold to Poldi by the antiquarian Giuseppe Basini on that date. 
Cavalca Sale confirmed, even if he took some distance from it, the attribution then in vogue to Piero della Francesca. The work would be referred to Pagliaro by the German scholar William von Bode in 1879. In addition to Cavalcaselle's drawings, I have examined all the 15 folders related to the exportation documents kept at the Archivio Storico of the Brera Academy, the archives of the Brera Superintendenza, and for the years after the unification of Italy, documents found at the Archivio Centrale di Stato in Rome. The notebooks of William Vauxhall, the second director of the National Gallery in London, and some letters preserved in the archive of the same museum were also examined. Among the materials that emerge, only a few particularly significant cases were selective. selected. Cavalcaselle's manuscript, datable to 1856 and 62 to 68, with the later additions, illustrate, before the diffusion of art photographs, the situation of Paul Di Pezzoli's collection in a phase preceding the inauguration of the museum and the situation of other private collections in Milano before some significant transfer of artworks abroad. The cases illustrated concern particularly artworks that were exported before and after the Brazense exhibition of 1872, in which were exhibited the main masterpieces held in the Milanese private collections. In the years uh, 1840 to 60, the first art search company conducted conducted by major international museum was active creating an increased competition between museum and collectors. In 1863, Cavalcaselle published the text sulla conservazione dei monumenti e degli oggetti d'arte, denouncing that Italy had been reduced to a bottega da ricattiere, an antique shop, and submitting the problem of the dispersion of national heritage to the attention of the government. The first case I illustrate is a very clear example of a conflict of interest that the period, the, that period unleashed. Even Cavalcaselle visited the Melzi collection in Milano, he did not have the opportunity to see the three, the three Perugino panels illustrated here, as they had already been taken for the National Gallery in London. They were, however, seen by Crove, the English diplomat and art historian with whom Cavalcaselle collaborated during his career once they arrived in London after 1857. This is not the only case of a drawing found in London relating to a work exported from Milano abroad and which allow us to observe the complementarity of the two archives of Cavalcaselle and Crove in Venice and London. The drawing showed the inventory number that the artwork still has in the museum, 228, with the indication late Certosa Pavia. The three panel in, came in fact from the lower register of a politic located in the chapel of San Michele Arcangelo in the Certosa of Pavia. They were taken in 1784 following the suppressions uh, and destined for the Brera Museum, but sold two years later to Giacomo Melzi for a song that Giuseppe Mangeri remembered as miserable. Islick and Mündler examined the three panels and acquired them in 1856 from the Melzi family in order to assign them to the English Museum. The exportation took place initially with a negative opinion from the Painting Commission of Brea Academy, composed of President Giuseppe Mongeri, the painter Francesco Hayez and the restorer Giuseppe Molteni, and caused scandal from the Milanese intellectual circles, Ginny Anderson and Susanna Ivory Quash, quoted the case of Alessandro Monzoni, who considered the export of the Perugino as one of the most significant losses of all the Italian heritage. The event followed one another on a fast rhythm and, rhythm and are reported in the Mundres Diary, the document in the Archivio di Stato in Milano, published by Malaguzzi Valeri in 1903, and the examination of the new documents found in Brera, giving us back the history to the point of view of all the actors in various capacities involved. On February 1856, Mundell recalls in, the, in his diary that he spoke with members of the Commission, in particular with Molteni, who, uh, while maintaining official position in the Bredense Institution as a member of the Painting Commission, secretary and conservator of the museum, was one of the protagonists of the Milanese art market. Molteni pay attention on the relevance of the three panels that were taken to the Academy for the live inspection. The Commission declared that the work 
who are well known and of great importance for the art history. And they had already been sold by the Melzi to the British National Museum for the impressive sum of 100,000 francs, pronouncing against export. export. On, the other hand, on the other hand, Molteni had promised Mulder his complete assistance, also because, according to the law of 1827, uh, uh, the government could not stop the export without buying the, the painting, which, as Mulder records in his diary, was out of question. Now the law is different and the state can notify an artwork without uh, buying it. Only three days later, Molteni himself tried to get Mundell a meeting with the Austrian uh, lieutenant. This was a few months before the liberation of Lombardy from the Austrian, and for the most difficult case, Milano turned to Vienna for a final opinion on the, on the export. The positive response came from Vienna two months later. As we will see in uh, other cases, the authority of the presenter could contribute to the granting of the export license. It, should, it, it should be noted, however, that in January 1857, uh, the Ministro della Pubblica Istruzione had dropped a circular to protect artworks located in the church from illicit export, concerned about the circulation in the territory of a connoisseur of fine art working for the British and French government. This was, this was most probably Mundell himself. Immediately after the export, the export was released, Molteni restored the panel in Milano on behalf of Istek in a practice that was to become established in the following years. In a letter of 1859 preserved in the National Gallery Archive, the English director stated that Molteni had already been in his agent here in Milano for two years, so much so that he intended to pay him 50 pounds. The letter clearly shows the conflicting role Molteni played as a member of the Export Commission, agent and the restorer for the English director. At the same time of the first Milanese notebooks in 1857, Cavalcaselle was offic officially sent to Italy by Istec to complete the project of a critical edition of Vasaris. The following year, after Munder's dismissal, dismissal as agent, Cavalcaselle made with Istec a, tip, a trip to central Italy, also to search paintings for the museum, making his, in his drawing several estimations of, art, of artworks on behalf of the English director. In the case of the first Milanese trip of Cavalcaselle, Mulder was still active on the peninsula as agent, and probably for this reason, Cavalcaselle made for Istec only one estimation. This is the note quadro di Istec, Londra, 18.000 franchi, painting of Istec in London, 18,000 francs, that Cavalcaselle put on the butinone of Casa Scotti, uh, then considered to be a mantegna due to the apocryphal signature put on it at the beginning of the 19th century. Cavalcaselle assigned the painting to Liberale da Verona, and I believe that releasing the affinity with the cosmetura that Isaac had recently acquired from Federico Frizzoni in Bergamo, it suggested him to buy the Scotti painting at this price. In London, two drawings from the Butinone can be referred to Cavalcaselle with note in English by Crowe. The page number at the top of the documents indicated that they are the illustrative drawings of the minute of the history of painting made 10 years after the notebook seen in the previous, in the previous slide. A letter from Vaslini to, to Bod, recently discovered by Martina Colombi, whom I thank, confirms that Kixek had made an offer for the painting of 20,000 lire and that still in 1870, Vaslini offered it for sale to Bode as an original by Mantegna, despite the fact that Cavalcaselle and Crowe have reported in, in the history that the signature was apocryphal. The correct attribution of the panel to Botinone came with Malaguzzi Valeri in 1902, and the following years the work entered the ministerial list of artwork of Sommo Pregio, I Evalvul, in private collection, which would prepare the, the first organic log for the protection of Italian heritage in 1909. The painting has never been exported and still in the Gallarati Scotti collection in Milano. A great masterpiece that instead left Italy forever under export, export circumstances that have, uh, that have not yet been clarified is the Litta Madonna, now in the Hermitage, 
Caval Castello saw the work in the Litta Palace twice, in 1857, as the notebook here illustrated, and between 1864 and 5, as the following drawing show. The second time, Caval Castello observes that the similar work, but with more fusion of color, is in the Moltenico studio. It is, in fact, the Litta Poldi Madonna, here in the museum, bought by Poldi from the Litta family before 1855, passing through Basdini. The work was restored by Molteni, in whose studio Caval Castello saw it, wondering if it was by Poldi. The comp this comparison of the two works made by Cavalcaselle is an interesting notation for the attribution debate that still involves the Hermitage work, work for the Russian Museum a masterpiece by Leonardo and for Italian scholar by the end of his assistant Voltraffio. In 1865, Duke Antonio Litta sold the work for the to the Russian Tsar Alexander II for the Hermitage. However, I did not found the export request in the archive of Milano and Rome. The next, the next case illustrating an illegal export. In 1857, the Lieutenant of Lombardy addresses to the Brera Academy a request for verification regarding the sale and export to Paris by the Vallardi brothers, Pietro and Giuseppe, well-known publisher and art dealer of the time, of a volume of drawing by Leonardo and the remaining collection partially exported and sold. Two reports by Giuseppe Mongeri are preserved in the archive of the Brera Academy, from which it emerged that the painting, presented as by Leonardo, Raffaello, Perugino and Tiziano, were for the most part evident, mani evident manipulation for commercial speculation, so much so that those, or those already exported had not found buyers abroad. Mongeri's consideration confirmed what Alessandro Morandotti pointed out regarding Ballardi's shame sales strategies. Mongeri also recalled that the drawings had all been exported clandestinely to Paris and that they were indeed some by Vinci, but only seven or eight originals. The purchase of the drawing had been negotiated here in Milano by Director, English, eh, by Director Istek and his agent Mundler, but had not been concluded due to the small number of originals in proportion to the high price. The official press had processed extensively with the export of the drawing considered by Leonardo. However, according to Mongeri, any control action would now have caused other illegal interventions by the Vallardis on, on, on the other work uh, still in Italy. It is in particular the so-called Codex Vallardi, sold to the Louvre as a work by Leonardo the year before, and which turned out to be by Pisanello and his school. In any case, it is a remarkable collection of 378 drawings that come out of Italy illegally. The following slide shows some cases of this sort of facilitation by the Italian government for international museum personalities, motivated by diplomatic reason or by the inability to detect the relevance of the artworks presented for export. In the years 1842-42, Gustav Friedrich Wagen, director of the Royal Museum of Russia, bought more than 70 paintings in Italy. In this period, the presentation of an export request on his behalf concerning, concerning nine frescoes by Lumini. In the documents, it is specified that the fresco had been transferred to Canva to canvas by the Brescian painter Giovanni Battista Speri before being sold to Wagen. The works were located in Brescia. The export permit was granted in September 1842. Vienna asked Brera for a special advice towards Wagen, acting for the Crown of Prussia. However, the works were presented in incognito as regards the real provenance. Di these are, in fact, some portion of the frescoes of Palazzo Rabia in Milano, engraved by Gaetano Zancon in 1812. They are, one of, they, are, they are one of Luini's most famous paintings and among, among his few works that Vasari recorded. It was only in 1811 that Luca Beltrami was the first to bring the works to the Berlin Museum back to Palazzo Rabia when the export had already take, taken place some time ago. Uh, posso, posso prendere un po' d'acqua? Ecco, 
scusate. In 1842, Antonio Brognoli from Brescia presented a deposition from the cross by Romanino for, ex for export on behalf of Wagen. Because it was a large artal piece, Brognoli asked for a direct inspection in Brescia where the work was kept. The examination was carried out by the Brescian painter Luigi Basiletti in charge of the Milanese Commission. In the first report, Basiletti indicated that the work is ascertained by Romanino and quoted by Ridolfi and Lanzi, on serving that Romanino's work were little known outside his homeland and that it was a masterpiece to, to be reserved. In the second report, the painter point out, probably intimated by the new governmental, governmental request, that he was afraid of seeing too much of his attachment to his country and asked to contact for someone else who was not from Brescia. In the end, the Commission grants the free exportation, arguing that in reality the work was not a masterpiece and that there were other more valuable works by Romanino in the churches of Padova and Brescia. The painting arrived at the Berlin Museum in 1842, but in 1945 it was destroyed in the fire that hit the bunker built by Hitler to house the work of the Berlin Museum. Among the London papers relating to Prove Cavalcaselle's inspection of the Berlin Museum, I found a drawing by Cavalcaselle, I show you, in which he regretfully indicates that the work coming from San Faustino Maggiore in Brescia, ora non vede si più in quella chiesa, now no longer seen in this church, and that Ridolfi had indicated it as one of the best of the painter. In 1857, an altarpiece by Bergognone with the lunette and the Polyptica by Romanino were presented for export by the Milanese company Buffet in Beruto on behalf of the English Museum. Initially, the commission focused only on the main panel of Bergognone and on the central panel of the Romanino, uh, considered far superior to the other compartments. The commission intends to verify whether the declared estimates, uh, which appear in the documents I show you, uh, were regular and acceptable to proceed with the acquisition of the two works. The resolution in favor of the export came once again for Vienna and was motivated by the estimate judged too high to have a margin for negotiation. This is the Politic of Sant Alexander, painted by Romanino for the high altar of Sant Alexander in Brescia, now in the National Gallery in London. Molteni restored the Politic for Istek in Milano with various inter interpretative interventions, a practice that was severely criticized by Cavalcaselle. The Bergognone came from the Certosa of Pavia, and then from a private oratory uh, not very from, far from the Certosa. Uh, Munder recalled that to facilitate the purchase of the Bergognone by the English Museum, a larger copy of the original was made to be left in the church. The lunette was lost of the sea during the transport. In a letter from the National Gallery Archives presented here, it is clear that it was on the Black Prince ship which left Genova for London, and that likely the British Museum had taken out insura insurance for the work. Among the material in London, I found the drawing I show you that Crowe drew from the main panel, viewing it in the museum after 1857. The next case concerns a strategy of presentation for export and sale of an alleged Raphael, probably failed. In March, in March 1850, the Brocca brothers presented their Madonna del Velo for export as a work by Raphael. The export is granted the following month without direct viewing of the work, as according to the Brocca motivation, the panel many years ago had been brought from abroad to Italy to be restored. And it is already known from the research of Chiara Battezzati. In 1829, Carl Friedrich von Rumor had gone to Milano on behalf of the Prince of Prussia to appraise the painting and then deduced that it was not a real Raphael, which was pre presented with great Rass and that it has been restored with great skill, so much so that for 10 years it, has, it had impressed many travelers without found any buyers. Today, the painting can cannot be traced, but I, it is known thanks to the engraving that was taken from it in 1835. Uh, among the London papers by Crove and Cavalcaselle, I found the drawing I show you that is taken from the engraving and not from the original painting. 
Despite the export license, the work had to remain in Italy because from the Box Aldare, we learned for the first time that still in 1869, the photographer Pompeo Pozzi presented it for sale to Boxal, exalting it as a Raphael masterpiece. The English director examined the painting personally in Milano in the Broca collection, judging it ineligible for the museum. Still in 1882, however, Clove and Cavalcaselle in their monograph on Raphael mentioned the Madonna as the best example of the, su the subject to be attributed to Ridolfo del Ghirlandaio from a doving or a carton by Raphael. Without being able to judge the original, we don't have uh, so much element. Uh, the engraving shows it as a painting of quality, but is, it, is, it should be noted that the print was made only after Molteni had restored the work. I will conclude with the last case concerning some works Cavalcaselle saw in the years 1862 268 in different Milanese collection and which were later exported abroad. In 1862, Cavalcaselle visited the Bonomi collection. This collection had already been the object of attention by Istek and Mundre, in particular the painting by Francesco Napoletano that Cavalcaselle had also postulated aroused great interest. Mundre recalled that the Bonomis were only willing to sell it for three times the purchase price. So negotiation did not take place. A few uh, years later, in 1895, Luigi Bonomi Cereda presented the painting for export together with the Marco Doggiono. The Francesco Napoletano was initially considered as a remarkable piece to be acquired by the state and with the correct indication that it had, be, it, it, uh, had been requested by, in the past by the National Gallery. Finally, however, Export was granted and the work arrived in, in, at the Gunsthaus in Zurigo, where it is now. The painting by Marco Doggiono was purchased by Bonomi uh, in 1851 through the art dealer Baslini and was annotated by Cavalcaselle 10 years after. In 1895, the Export Commission asked that he remain in Italy. Bonomi Cereda therefore agreed to sell the work to the Crespi. In fact, it was uh, decided to divert the purchase of uh, relevant works to be kept in Italy to the Crespi family, as they had a gallery opened uh, to the public as a sort of a museum. In 1910, uh, the state began to notify many works in the collection, including the Marco Doggiono, <coughs> until, uh, due to the, some financial problems of the collection's founder, the industrial Cristoforo Benigno Crespi, the family decided to offer the entire collection for sale abroad. The affair related to the export permit was very painful for the Italian public and uh, for the ministry, so much so that it lasted four years from 1911 to 14, when the Paris auction of the collection took place. The Dogiono was sold to the French capital on that occasion and since 1951 has been in the Louvre, which deposited it in the Blanc Museum. The next slide illustrate a portrait of a, man, of a man by Bartolomeo Veneto, seen by Cavalcaselle in the Milanese collection of Ca Agostino Perego. The drawing, made before 1868, is an antiquem for the work's entry into that collection. In 1871, Cavalcaselle and Crove were the first to publish the painting, reporting it as being by Andrea Solario, and the following year it was exhibited at Brera. It entered the Crespi collection before 1891, again as a masterpiece by Solario. It was Adolfo Venturi who attributed it to Bartolomeo Veneto nine years after. The painting was finally notified in 1910, but exported two years later. Since 1939, it is located in the National Gallery in Washington. The, works was, the work was part of the disputed agreement between the Crespi family and the Italian state, where the family donated the, the nativity of Caravaggio to the Pinacoteca di Brera in exchange for permission to export the other works in the collection, even if some, such as the Bartolomeo Veneto and the Dogiono, had already been notified. The press was enlisted against the agreement signed by the state, considering the Crespi family attitude not a true donation, but a sort of escamotage to obtain the export of all the, wo of all the other works, point out the inadequacy of the label placed in the museum under Correggio alluding to the Crespi donation.
Here I show you a telegram from the museum director, Corrado Ricci, in which he asked for the incriminate label to be removed. Against the background of the cases examined so far, it is evident that the issue of attribution, restoration, and protection of artworks were complex and delicate in the Paul Di Pezzoli years and at the beginning of the 19th century, as they still are today, however, with different consideration. Thank you for your attention. This is the last paper today, but it's one I'm looking forward to enormously. Martina um, Crosby from the University of Milan is going to talk about the Milanese antique dealers, Baslini and Grandi, and the international market. Baslini is someone whom we've heard about all throughout the conference. I've attempted to write about him at some time, but I'm looking forward very much to knowing more about him. And, uh, you know, as, as I understand from the summary, perhaps, that he was an autodidact. Which is, which is, again, to go back to the question I asked Alessandro Morandotti. You know, this is very interesting how art history is constructed. So thank you very much, and please welcome her to the stand. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon. It is a, a really difficult task to conclude such a, an important event for the studies dedicated to Gian Giacomo Paul di Pezzoli. But at the same time, I'm very grateful for this opportunity because this museum and many scholars here, here today have guided my education and research by their publications. On several occasions during this study day, it has been proved that the context in which Gian Giacomo Paul Di Pezzoli acted had an international scope. In fact, since the last decades of the 18th century onwards, we have seen a progressive internationalization of the European art market culminated in the event when Gian Giacomo built up his own collection and we saw art dealers as major players. In this contribution, I will provide two concrete examples of the opening of the Milanese art market to the international context, the fascinating story of Giuseppe and the business of the Grandi Company. I will start from Giuseppe Baslini for two particular reasons. Firstly, his privilege with Gian Giacomo Paul di Pezzoli. So close, both defined the dealer as the actual creator of the Paul di Pezzoli collection. <laughs> Secondly, the considerable merit that this museum has had in discovering this figure. In fact, it is thanks to Annalisa Zanni that the first and for about 20 years the only scientific publication dedicated to Baslini has been published. Annalisa Zanni an introductory biographical profile of the antiquarian using unpublished documents given to the museum by the Baslini heirs, together with two different donations. In 1993, two watercolors by Luigi Cavenaghi, depicting the dealer and his wife, Marianna Grandi. In 1999, the portrait of Giuseppe Baslini, painted by Bertini. The time at my disposal is short for me to go through Baslini's biography. I have already reported it on other occasions. Even if it's really exciting and, according to his contemporaries, full of spicy anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> but I only remember... <laughs> <laughs> Alfredo Melani tells me that I don't know. <laughs> I only remember one aspect, the most surprising for me. Baslini was a true self-made man. He moved to Milan from the area around Pavia at a very young age with no capital and no education and managed to become the most important dealer in paintings and object art in Milan thanks to his connoisseurship, his business flair and his great entrepreneurship which led him to revolutionize the profession of art, mer art merchant making it more complex, original and multifaceted. Regarding his beginnings which are still veiled by mystery Important news has emerged in the last weeks. Some invoices kept in the archives of the Poldi Pezzoli Museum attest a link between Baslini and the wood carvers Bernardino and Giuseppe Speluzzi, confirming a long family legend with, um, according to which Baslini's first job in Milan was an apprenticeship in a cabinet-making workshop. And I would like to thank a lot Lavinia Galli for this tip. 
Basilini's success is witnessed by the writings of his contemporaries, Carlo Barbiano di Belgioioso, Alfredo Melani, even Giovanni Morelli, who admired and at the same time fairly criticized him, as well as Baudet's autobiography and the travel notebooks of Charles Rockistlake and Otto Mundler. In this perspective, the studies of Jenny Anderson, Susanne Everyquosh, and Carol Tonieri died have been extremely helpful for me. But the antiquarian's fortune is also attested by archive materials, in particular, a document that was long forgotten among the papers of the notary archives in Milan. It is the postmortem inventory discovered in 2017 by the scholar Monia Faraoni, who has generously shared it with me. The inventory describes all movable and immovable property owned by Basilini at the time of his death, and the, the involvement of Luigi Cavenaghi in the evaluation of the paintings is worth mentioning. The merchant extensive property holdings, holdings are impressive. Oh. A building in Via Monte Napoleone, number 11, with three warehouses, two shops, and his home, flats at number 13 and 15 Via Monte Napoleone, a home with a shop in Via Bagutta, but also lands, houses, and a big mansion in Merate, where the antiquarian's burial place is also preserved with a funerary monument by the sculptor Donato Barcaglia. The inventory shed light on several other aspects of, of the dealer's business. Firstly, the heterogeneity of his interests, not only paintings, but also ivories, bronzes, jewelry, porcelain, glass, textiles, which made him an important reference for eclectic collectors, particularly the owners of the house museums. Furthermore, this document refutes the hypothesis suggested by several scholars of a Basilini collector. Most of the listed art, art objects, including paintings, were in fact stored in the warehouses. The fact that only a small number of paintings, oriental porcelain and bronzes were displayed in some room of Basilini's apartment pictures not so much the home of a collector but the rooms of a house shop set up for customers and visitors. Finally, I have compared the postmortem inventory with the catalog of the Milanese sale organized by Baslini Sears on the 26th of November 1888 in the halls of Giulio Sambon's auction house. The similarities between inventory and catalog are very close. This means that none of Baslini's five sons had an intention of continuing their father's business. Despite this, as I will demonstrate in a few minutes, his professional legacy would not have been extinguished. Among more than 1,000 objects presented at this auction, a few have been identified. I will, I will only mention from the Trivulzio, later Bergioioso collection, a group of ivories for which I refer to the studies by Alessandra Squizzato and Francesca Tasso but also bronzes and the Saint John the Baptist with a lamb by Lorenzo Costa, at the time ascribed to Solario, kept since 1960 in Brera, together with the preparatory drawing. A group of paintings from the Costabili collection in Ferrara, but also the portrait of a clergyman by Giovanni Battista Moroni, which the Musée du Louvre acquired on, on this occasion. An ancient copy of a famous painting by Lorenzo Lotto, the original, is uh, now uh, in the Gemelde Ga Gallery in Berlin, which remained at least uh, until the 60s with Baslini's heirs. And finally, a bronze group by Massimiliano Soldani Benzi, inscribed in the catalog to Pietro Tacca and now in the Seattle Art Museum. Recent investigations in the archives of the Tribulzio Foundation, reported by Jenny Anderson, have shown that the statement with which Bode describes Baslini as the actual creator of the Paul di Pezzoli collection is hyperbolic. Gian Giacomo, <laughs> Gian Giacomo in fact played a leading role in the formation of his collection. However, it is undeniable that there was a trust-based relationship between the two, which guaranteed the count priority in purchases and advantages in payments, and which would continue even after the collector's death. This is attested by the antiquarian's postmortem inventory, which records a credit of 6,000 lire to the museum, but also by the payment orders, first studies by Fernanda Wittgens and then by Alessandra Mottola Molfino. The Basilini provenance of a large number of objects in the museum is already known and fully investigated. 
But Basini was also a donor to this institution, and this is something to be highlighted because he was always distinguished by his greed, not so much by his liberality. In 1886, he donated to the museum this Lombard enamel diptych, formerly in the Tribulzio Belgioioso collections. The dealings with the Bagatti Valsecchi brothers, instead, have been less investigated up to now. Seven invoices and two letters unpublished are preserved in the archives of the House Museum, proving that Baslini sold a huge variety of objects to the collectors, arms and armors, bronze and copper objects, gold jewelry, textiles, sculptors, four paintings on wood, and on something on top of this, on the 1st of July, 1882, Baslini sold 53 meters of red lampas to the Bagatti Valsecchi. They were probably intended for the bedspread and canopy of the renowned Red Room. But Baslini's business went well beyond Milan and Lombardy. His trade in the Italian country, which must have been widespread and prestigious, are still to be investigated. With the help of the scholar Serena d'Italia, whom I thank, Baslini's presence in Piedmont was confirmed. It was there that the art dealer bought a triptych by Girolamo Giovenone and Defendente Ferrari, now in the Borgogna Museum in Vercelli, but also two paintings by Martino Spanzotti, now at the National Gallery in London. Baslini had also connections in Genoa. He himself introduced Julius Meyer, director of the Gemelde Galerie, and his assistant Bode, to one of the most illustrious galleries in the city, the Milius Collection. We know that in Florence, he was in touch with his colleague Stefano Bardini, because in 1882, he helped him to illegally export to France to Botticelli frescoes from the Villa Lemmi, now in the Louvre. He also dealt with Rome, where he had a prestigious client. The Marquis Gian Pietro Campana bought a real masterpiece from him, which had also attracted the interest of Eastlake and Mundler, the lunette of Cosmetura's Roverella Polyptic, now in the Louvre. Even more interesting, however, are his international dealings, which followed three different routes, London, Berlin, and Paris. Both in London and Berlin were the two buyers with the greatest purchasing power in Europe in the second half of the 19th century, the National Gallery and the Gemelde Galerie. I will not dwell on Baslini's transactions with the National Gallery, something about them was uh, reported before by Susanne Vericoche. They are without doubt the most successful, but also the best known to scholars. Reading through Eastlake's and Mundler's travel diaries, it is clear that Baslini adopted a far-sighted business strategies towards these powerful clients, presenting himself not only as a provider of masterpieces, but also as an informer, mediator, and consultant. This aspect of his profession is also emphasized by Bode in the Mein Leben, a useful witness for tracing the relationship between Baslini and Berlin. Since 1872, Meyer, who was nominated director of the Gemelde Galerie in 1868, had undertaken a systematic purchasing campaign in Italy. Bode was his assistant in a role similar to that played by Mundler for the National Gallery, reports in his autobiography not only the successful deals, for example, the acquisition of a Madonna and Child by Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio and the portrait of a young man by Cristoforo Solari, which is now in Moscow in the Pushkin Museum, but also the opportunity missed because of Meyer, whose continuous reconsiderations in most cases favored the English competitors. Among these are the famous group of paintings by Moretto, Moroni, and Savoldo, formerly in the Fenaroli collection in Brescia, and also Andrea Solario's Portrait of a Man with a Pink from the Milius Collection. I will present for the first time on this occasion a second unpublished evidence, kept in the archive of the Berlin State Museums. 15 letters sent by Baslini to Meyer and Bode between 1870 and 1879. Baslini's first missive is a real business card. He not only proposes himself as a supplier of masterpieces, but also states that uh, he is ready to negotiate, buy works of art on behalf of the museum, travel. Thanks to his several networks, he can also introduce Bode to important Italian galleries or act as a mediator in his absence to later join him in Berlin. 
Looking through the correspondence, it is, evident, it is evident that the German Museum took advantage of the different services offered by the antiquarians, but also of its multiple connections, not only in Milan, but also in Verona, Genoa, Florence, Rome, and London. In December 1875, Mayer commissioned Baslini to buy, to buy a small reliquary, now ascribed to a follower of Perugino, from the Florentine banker Brini. For a fee of 2,000 francs, a very high percentage if, if we consider that the total value of the deal was 19,500 francs, Baslini handled the negotiations, the export formalities, and the shipment of the painting. He had already tried and failed on other occasions to sell paintings from private Italian collection as a mediator. Let me mention just a few of his most significant offerings. Two large landscapes by Salvatore Rosa, with episodes from the life of St. John the Baptist, now in Glasgow, recorded by Baslini at the Dufour Bert House in Florence. Benvenuto Cellini's Bindo Altoviti, which attracted Bode's interest in 1870, but would remain in Rome's Palazzo Altoviti until 1888. Only 10 years later, it appeared on the antiques market, where it was bought by Isabella Stewart Gardner, under the recommendation of Bernard Berenson. In the spring of 1873, Baslini proposed to Bode two altarpieces from important Milanese private collections. From the gallery of Duke Ludovico Melzi de Rilla, a Madonna and Child, St. Peter and St. Jerome by Cesare Magni, assigned at the time to Cesare da Sesto and now in the Pinacoteca Ambrosiana in Milan. Olga Piccolo, whom I thank, sent me this sketch by Cavalcaselle, made when he visited Baslini's shop. From the Duke's Scottish collection, this uh, altarpiece uh, by Butinone, already mentioned by Olga Piccolo. The dealer repeatedly offered in his letter also two Veronese artworks uh, owned by the Spinetta Malaspina family, a marble altar and a wooden bas relief uh, dating 1418. Unfortunately, I have not managed to identify the second sculptor, while the first could be the monument to Marquis Spinetta Malaspina, already in the Church of San Giovanni in Sacco in Verona. It was purchased by Jean Paul Richter in 1886 for the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Baslini was also a very useful consultant and informer. Thanks to his recommendations, the museum bought in 1873 from Harry and Janet Ross in Florence the Education of Pan by Luca Signorelli, a painting lost during the Second World War. Finally, he offered himself several times as a seller, presented artworks in his shop. They were rejected by the German institution, but later proved to be museum worthy. From the Milius collection in Genoa, not only the already mentioned Solario, now in the National Gallery in London, but also a Renaissance bronze replica of the Mercury Belvedere, since 1959 at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Before arriving in Genoa, it was in the courtyard of Antonio Ramirez di Montalvo's palace in Florence. But what is particularly interesting are the negotiations for the Lodi Madonna, donated by Count Janos Palfi to the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest in 1908. A new element can now be added to the reconstruction of the collecting and market history of this painting due to Monia Faraoni and again Olga Piccolo. Baslini, who had bought the painting from Federico Frizzoni and had already tried unsuccessfully to sell it to the National Gallery, had planned a Berlin destination for the work before selling it to the Hungarian count. The altarpiece was even sent to Berlin in January 1873, I saw the transport document that is preserved in the museum archives and examined for a very long time before being returned to Milan in July. A very similar outcome would have been the following year for a portrait of an 18-year-old young man by Polego with a few of Florence, which probably corresponds to this portrait by Domenico Puligo, now in a private collection in Bromfield Oakley Park. When this painting reached Berlin in May 1874, it was immediately sent back because it was damaged. Actually, not all the artworks offered by Baslini were delivered. In most cases, the antique dealer used a new technology that was to revolutionize the art mar market, that is, photography. 
Vaslini also found good strategies for doing business in Paris. Here, he couldn't gain much from the national museums, so whose budget were small if compared to those of English and German institutions, but from a lively and competitive art market. It is not by chance that the only known sales organized by Vaslini were held at the Hotel Drouot in Paris. In 1862, an auction of furniture and object art, and in 1868, of over 80 paintings coming from illustrious Lombard collection. The catalog, unfortunately, is not illustrated and only refers to the iconography and the attribution of the painting. This has complicated the identification of the pieces, which has, however, been successful in some cases. I will run very quickly through the lots I've been able to identify, also with the help of professors Giovanni Agosti and Jacopo Stoppa. A Madonna and Child by Andrea da Murano, whose signature is identical to that of a painting formerly in the Drago collection in Rome and then in the Cini collection in Venice. The crucifixion with scenes of the Passion by Antonio Campi at the Louvre, attributed to Bassano in the catalog, seen by Mundler in 1856 in the Milanese house of Angelo de Amici. And from the same place came also a copy of the portrait of Isabella de' Medici by Bronzino, now housed at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. A work attributed to Giorgione, depicting the drunken Sileno, which may correspond to a fragment by Cima da Conegliano, now in the Johnson Collection in Philadelphia, and previously in the collection of, Ad of Adult Tiem in Sanremo. A Madonna and Child, St. John and St. Jerome by Palma il Vecchio, purchased in 1930 from the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest. Another Madonna and Child, but this time by Marco Palmezzano, signed and dated, which after numerous transfers ended up at the Fondazione Cassa di Risparmio di Cesena. A Last Supper by Giambattista Tiepolo, which I compared to a painting now in the Louvre, recorded in 1875 in the gallery of Charles Edelmeyer in Paris. This French antiquarian also acquired a portrait of a man seated at a window by Tintoretto, now in a private Canadian collection, which may correspond to Lot 66, formerly belonging to the painter Giuseppe Molteni. The careful iconographic description of Lot 69, already in the Castelbarco collection, made possible my last identification, a triptych mentioned in the Moratiglia collection in Paris until 1970, considered by Federico Zeri a work by a 15th century Ligurian artist. As already anticipated, Basini's professional legacy didn't end with his death, even if none of his sons decided to continue the paternal trade. Marianna, his wife, was in fact the daughter of Antonio Grandi, who had started a family business in Corso di Porto Orientale, later Corso di Porta Venezia, in the mid 19th century initially specialized in buying and selling antique, antique drawings and prints. The activity was then continued by his sons Carlo and Antonio until the 30s and extended to paintings and art objects. The dealing of the Grandi Company can be investigated quite easily because the family archive still exists today and is carefully preserved by the heir Laura Grandi. These archives have been researched in recent years by a group of students by the University of Milan, coordinated by Professor Giovanni Agosti and Jacopo Stoppa. I have studied for my doctoral project The Correspondence, a collection of over 500 documents, letters, postcards, invoices, that helped me to define Grandi's business strategies and their network of relations, having from the very start an international scope. One of the most significant traits of the company was that of reproductive engravings. This is testified by a conspicuous donation of prints and copper plates that Filippo Grandi and his sister bequeathed to the Raccolta delle Stampe Achille Bertarelli in 1957. But I have also found in the Central Archive of the Berlin State Museum six letters sent by Antonio Grandi to Willem von Bode between 1891 and 1913. In the second of these letters, the first one went, un went unanswered, the art dealer proposed himself as intermediary for the purchase of paintings and sculptures from important Milanese connections, collections, signing himself as brother-in-law with the deceased Mr. Baslini. 
It is evident, even by consulting the, co the company's account books, that there is a close link between Vaslini's death and the expansion of Grandi's business. The successful legacy of one of the most distinctive figures in Milan, as Alfredo Melani defined Baslini, was to continue for a few more decades, to end in the years between the two world wars. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, better? Yes, I thought that was a very brilliant uh, paper about the biographies of people who really shaped the art market and, uh, and our knowledge of painting. Would you like to have a discussion now? I know we've gone over time. I, uh, yes, two minutes. Okay, I mean, was there any alternative to Milan? What might be one question you could ask? I mean, we've thought about Florence, some of the papers. Uh, what about Rome? <laughs> there are people in Rome who are not unlike Maltini and Baslini in this period. So, you know, was there an alternative to Milan? That's one question I thought of. Lavinia, what about you? No, ho, ho una domanda per Alessandra Squizzato e una per Silvia Davoli. Allora, quella per Squizzato, eh, Alessandra, se puoi un po' riassumerci molto velocemente quali possono essere le fonti che possiamo usare come guide, eh, cioè le guide che possiamo usare come fonti, ho sbagliato a spiegarmi, ehm, per una ricerca sulle collezioni private nella prima metà dell'Ottocento, se puoi darci solo due o tre indicazioni un po' più veloci. Ok, e, e la seconda è per Silvia, eh, perché stavo pensando, quando tu mi hai chiesto... Eh, ma Gian Giacomo ha eh, Vico nella sua biblioteca, ti ho risposto di no, ed è così. Eh, però c'è un incredibile numero di volumi degli anni 40 dell'Ottocento eh, dedicati alle culture extraeuropee, agli usi e costumi, e sono sicuramente suoi perché sono editi negli anni 40 dell'Ottocento, dunque non possono essere neanche dei genitori. E visto quello che ci hai raccontato di Vico, mi stavo domandando se fosse questa serie di volumi eh, editi in Italia, illustrati e molto ricchi, fossero una conseguenza di quello che tu ci hai raccontato o possono essere messi in relazione con questo eh, interesse molto milanese per le culture extraeuropee, che appunto poi ha un esito nel Museo Cavaleri. Lascio qua il microfono. Rispondo sinteticamente, la domanda è impegnativa. Le guide sono tante, sono state pubblicate con grande frequenza da tanti editori milanesi, io ve ne ho, ve ne ho presentate qualcuna, quella di Luigi Bossi che conosciamo bene nel 1819, tutte le edizioni di Vallardi, dell'Itinerer che sono molto importanti e, a, e quella di Parravicini ad esempio sul, sul finale del secolo. La dottoressa Zanni ha scritto un bellissimo saggio nei due volumi del Bagatti Valsecchi, un bellissimo convegno sulla seconda metà dell'Ottocento in cui le declina tutte, le ha descritte in maniera molto, molto precisa perché in Ambrosiana in particolare c'è un fondo molto importante che, le, che ne possiede veramente, veramente molte. L'altro fondo importante è il centro stendaliano della Biblioteca Sormani che anche ha una buona raccolta di guide. Il problema della guida è che mh, Alessandro Morandotti l'ha diciamo, anche illustrato molto bene in diversi suoi affondi, 
ehm, cioè, sono tutte fonti da incrociare perché molto spesso gli editori sono appunto dei promotori quindi le attribuzioni sono da prendere un po' con le pinze sono sempre da contestualizzare è molto importante secondo me incrociare spesso le fonti io ad esempio per questo saggio ho usato anche gli handbook mh, inglesi o c'è cioè altre fonti e incrociando i dati mi sono accorta che appunto in alcuni casi le, cioè sull'attribuzione c'erano delle tendenze culturali in atto o delle preferenze non, non un'oggettività quindi sono le, le guide secondo me sono un po' un terreno scivoloso da, da utilizzare bisogna essere cioè bisogna essere accorti ecco. Su Poli Pezzoli e Vico ci avevo pensato perché in realtà c'è un collegamento diretto che è eh, Cristina di Belgioioso che nel 1800, non mi ricordo, 30 e rotti, cioè lei eh, presenta una traduzione di Vico in francese, in abito francese a Parigi, incontra Giuseppe Ferrari, io non l'ho introdotto però Ferrari vive a, a Parigi e quindi i due si incontrano. Eh, per cui questo potrebbe essere effettivamente una, una, una connessione relativamente diretta. C'è un altro problema però, che è il fatto che sicuramente Cristina di Belgioioso, così come Manzoni anche, c'è cioè tutta un'area intellettuale milanese che però è cattolica, mentre invece Romagnosi, Cavaleri e Compagnia Bella sono repubblicani, federalisti, assolutamente laici. E questo un po' ovviamente influenza la loro lettura di, di Vico è un, un fatto importante, cioè da una parte abbiamo una tendenza di più a una, una lettura idealista, quindi anche filo a un certo punto, cioè che, che si abbraccia e si lega a tutta una, una storiografia culturale italiana di un certo tipo, dall'altra invece abbiamo Romagnosi e il suo gruppo che sono, sembrano quasi neocantiani, cioè sono proprio razionalisti, pragmatici, si rifanno eh, molto alla filosofia per esempio pragmatica inglese, quindi questa è una cosa. Poi effettivamente è vero, Carlo Cattaneo è... Ehm, è stato direttore della, della società di incoraggiamento, adesso non mi ricordo più, sono stanca, è da, di arti e mestieri, Cernuschi, c'è cioè Milius, anche lì la culture, c'è tutto, una, tutto una, una, un gruppo che sicuramente, e queste informazioni, gli articoli di, di Carlo Cattaneo sono articoli importanti, certo, è vero che gli storici dell'arte ovviamente hanno guardato poco a questa documentazione perché è documentazione legata a una visione etnografica, della, però è, è affascinante e poi Carlo Cattaneo è un filosofo, e un pensatore molto affascinante, importante io credo, quindi perché no? Cioè, è possibile che ci siano effettivamente delle, delle connessioni. Grazie. Altre domande? Altre domande? Alessandro, tu non hai niente da dire? <ride> sono, sono contento di essere rimasto fino alla fine sfidando anche il mal di schiena e perché è stata una giornata molto, molto bella, molto ricca e, e questo è quello che si capisce che per fortuna le ricerche vanno sempre avanti, ci sono molte cose nuove e, e quindi come dire, non c'è solo la Firenze di Bardini ma c'è anche la Milano di Baslini e, e questo è importante credo davvero che in qualche modo ma insomma, un po' si capiva che, che Milano davvero è uno dei grandi centri e, e queste nuove ricerche che eh, insomma, sono, sono emerse lo dimostreranno e lo continueranno a dimostrare insomma. quindi mi sembra un'ottima un iniziativa e, ed è stato molto bello anche questo incontro eh, eh, non anglo-fiorentino ma an anglo-milanese insomma no? quindi eh, è così insomma eh, forse eh, ci, ci, ci saranno dei nuovi libri delle nuove ricerche che restituiranno molto, molto, molto bene la ricchezza di queste relazioni e la vivacità di, eh, diciamo della storia del mercato del collezionismo e degli studi eh, della Milano come dire prima e dopo Paul di Pezzoli. Grazie a tutti voi. I think it remains to thank everybody, Annalisa Zanni and her team here, the scientific committee, all the speakers who came, and thank you all for a rather wonderful day. Do you want to... Oh,
No, un appunto per, per tutti coloro che hanno partecipato, eh, ehm, i paper verranno pubblicati dal, sul journal eh, for the history of collections e, e io manderò eh, a breve istruzioni rispetto a lunghezza degli interventi, eventuali annex, se ci sono mh, documenti d'archivio che vogliono essere eh, inclusi, numero di, di figure eccetera eccetera e anche le deadline. Quindi, <ride> e tra l'altro, <ride> la eh, sai che adesso non guardato, quindi non vorrei dire delle cose che sono allarmanti e poi invece c'erano altri sette mesi. No scherzo, mi faccio sentire al più presto. Da parte proprio della Fondazione Artistica Poldi Pezzoli a tutti le persone, a tutti gli studiosi che hanno lavorato a lungo in questa ricerca è, questo ritengo sia davvero l'omaggio più importante a quella straordinaria figura che è stata Gian Giacomo Poldi Pezzoli eh, ci saranno tante altre attività conferenze, incontri per bambini, per tutti ma questa è una pietra miliare e I hope to keep on cooperating, perché eh, avete dimostrato che ancora molto c'è da scoprire su queste connessioni. Già gli ultimi due interventi hanno dato delle tracce per nuovi percorsi e chiediamo ad Alessandro Morandotti di affidare qualche tesi su questi argomenti, per esempio, o a voi tutti, perché è, la è sulla ricerca che si fonda la conoscenza e quindi la storia dell'identità di questo luogo e ognuno di voi ha aggiunto un tassello veramente importante e di questo vi siamo tutti molto molto grati. Buona serata.